Okay, uh, everybody, thank you for joining. Welcome to the Monday, February 1st, 2021 uh, Town Council Workshop. Uh, we have several items on the agenda tonight. Matt, I, before we get going, I didn't know um, why you've got all of us, uh, if you uh, have any plans for tomorrow for staff or um, the storm and everything. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, took the thoughts yep. uh, thoughts right out of my head. We will be uh, we will be closing tomorrow. At least the town office, uh, TML, uh, community services. The pool may be open later in the day, uh, so people can check the uh, website for updates on that. Uh, but we're looking at getting you know, <laughs> I've seen the I've seen the range from a dusting to to 15 inches. So uh, classic classic Maine northeaster. So uh, but we're looks like you know the, the most Recent confirmation is somewhere from eight to eight to fourteen, uh, is what we're looking at here. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, folks have been instructed and they've taken home their uh, units, and they will be working remotely uh, tomorrow and, and keeping it, keeping out of the way of uh, public works, uh, who will be well engaged tomorrow. But thank thank you for asking. Yep, no problem. I uh, hope everybody, staff, and otherwise stays um, stay safe. Uh, you, during the storm. So, um, so the first item on our agenda tonight is a presentation by the uh, Santon Company. Um, this is regarding a proposed multi-family development um, in the town center at what's being referred to as Ocean House Commons. Um, so I saw, I think, in the participant list that we've got a few of the folks from um, the Santon is, am, I say, am I pronouncing that right? Zanton. Zanton. Yes. Zanton? Yep. Zanton. Um, uh, that are joining us tonight. Um, so I am um, more than happy um, to yield the floor to Nathan and uh, Kristen um, from the developer, but then we'll also additionally have time for some public comment, but I think it makes most sense to um, have a, a, an overview um, and uh, get a little bit of an idea of the project uh, before opening it up to public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can, can you hear yeah. me? Loud and clear. Okay. And we've, we see you both in the gallery, so. Great. Um, with, with me is Kristen Martin, who is a development officer with the Zanton Company, and she would be the project manager if this project moves forward. Um, and and our, our business partner, Bobby Monks, um, was trying to get into this meeting and he, he, he called me just about five minutes ago and, and said that he wasn't able to get in. I, I, I wasn't, I just, I forwarded him the link and I, d does it look like he's in, in now? Oh, uh, good. Nathan, I see him as a yeah, participant. Nathan, there. So. Okay, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Would you like me to uh, get him on screen with us as well? Nathan, yeah, or? if that would be great. Cause then he'll, he'll, if, if he can be in a posture where he can, uh, where he can speak, that would be great. Perfect. I um, just made it so, so thank you for, for asking. Just wanted to make sure, I wasn't sure. sure and I didn't want to presume. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, so, um, so, and Bobby is now here and he, he is my longtime business partner and also a longtime Cape Elizabeth resident. Um, so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna give a presentation which I'll narrate the beginning of and then Kristen will take over and narrate the last part of and Bobby will feel free to um, as will I to, to just add add things for color commentary as as we go along or or you know <clears throat> to embroider as we go along. So um, if we could put up the slide presentation. Yep, bear with me just one second. Sure. <clears throat> now I know that um, members of the council have seen this before, or actually uh, not exactly this. It's we've we've revised it a little bit, um, but very similar, but. Um, I know since this is open to the public, um, hopefully some members of the public will be watching tonight as well. And it will also be a refresher for, um, for, for counselors. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a, a photo of the site um, where we're proposing this 49 unit housing development. Um, it's the, the rear two lots um, of town, town center circle, um, which, which is right next to town hall um, and right next to, uh, uh, right next to what will be Dr. Jacobson's dental office. Um, he's developing uh, uh, that, and I believe he is here as well tonight. Um, so next slide, please. Or I guess I can move it forward. 
Um, no, not tonight. Um, so um, this is just a slide about a little bit about us. Um, we've developed 11 um, apartment complexes since 2004 uh, with 560 units. 10 of those 11 are in Maine. Um, and of those 10, four are in Portland, uh, two are in Biddeford, three are in Lewiston or Auburn, and one's in Bath. Um, we manage all of these properties ourselves and we're very proud of our, our management approach. We, we really put our residents at the center of, of what we do and really emphasize a, an outstanding resident experience. <clears throat> we also um, are very responsive to other stakeholders in addition to residents such as city staff and elected officials and neighbors and we liberally give out I liberally give out my cell phone number to those stakeholders so, to, so that I can be held accountable and others in our company can be held accountable for having an excellent project. Next slide. The next four slides are examples of work that we've done in the area. Um, this one is, um, I, I don't know if I have cursor control here, but um, yeah. in, the, in the lower left um, is what the building looked like uh, when we bought it in 2003. And we, in the upper right is what it looks like now. Um, we added 27 apartments on top of this existing neighborhood parking garage that really wasn't contributing much aesthetically or financially to, to, to the neighborhood. Um, and the, the shot on the upper left is just a typical apartment inside. This is, as all of our projects are, it's mixed income. So it includes both what is called in our business affordable and also market rate apartments. The market rate apartments are available to anyone regardless of their income and they rent for whatever the market will bear. And the affordable, so-called affordable units uh, rent for typically three or $400 less per month than the market rate. Um, and they go to households whose income does not exceed 60% of the area median income. Next slide. So this one is our second project. It's also in Portland on Congress Street near Maine Medical Center. Um, it was that scene in the lower left before we built it. Um, it, it was an abandoned uh, gas station and we built this 40 unit brick uh, structure um, also with mixed income with 18 market rate and 22 affordable units um, called Walker Terrace. And the picture in the upper right is a, just a typical unit inside with stairs going up to a, a deck. Next slide. This is uh, the third one we did in Portland. It was on the site of in the lower left, um, the old um, New England Imports car repair establishment. Um, we took down that one story building and, and built a five story um, brick apartment building with 43 apartments, um, 30 affordable and 13 market rate. Um, and the upper left is just a, a typical apartment inside. And then this, this is an image of, of a project that we have in development right now um, for which we've received all, all of our approvals from the town of Old Orchard Beach. This is uh, on Portland Avenue, very near uh, the town hall um, and kind of between uh, the the shopping plaza that has a has a has a, a, sh a shop and save and uh, town hall, so it's very very walkable. And the building in the rear of the of the largest image is uh, what we're going to be building there. It's 55 apartments um, for uh, for residents who are 55 and older. Um, and the lower left is is what the site looks like now. Um, we're going to be building back in the woods where the, where the woods you see in the rear, and the, the parking lot will remain as our parking lot. And this image in the upper right here is, a, is from the inside of a unit that we, a, a project we just completed in Bayside near Bayside Bowl, and just opened its doors about two weeks ago called Furman Block. Um, since the Old Orchard Beach one hasn't been built yet, um, we just, we are showing a, a, from a different, an interior from a different project. So um, that's kind of a little bit about the kinds of projects that we do um, and, and um, now we're shifting to this project, the project that we are um, wanting to ask you about tonight. Um, so um, we, we have put under contract lots three and four in, in this Ocean House Commons subdivision, um, which includes the, the buffer easements in the rear um, that Kristen's showing with the cursor. Um, those buffer easements are wooded uh, parcels that have conservation easements on them that cannot be built upon. 
So the only area that can be built upon is what you're seeing shown as lot four and lot three there where the cursor is now um, and, and, and a connector to connect those lots. Um, and then next to it, uh, to, to the right is Dr. Jacobson's proposed building, which is close to beginning construction, um, which will be a dental practice on the ground level and then some, a few apartments above, maybe two or three. I'm not exactly sure the number, but in that vicinity. Um, and then lot one um, is for sale. And I know Dr. Jacobson is hoping to have a, a commercial establishment such as a restaurant or coffee shop. And we think that that would be terrific um, complement to what we're doing um, because it would be a great amenity for our residents and our residents, and we would provide a lot of customers for it. Um, <clears throat> and to the left of the, in the left of the image is, is town hall. So you can just see where just to, I should have said that at the beginning. And at the bottom is, is Ocean House Road. So that's kind of just showing, oh, and then we, you can see the parking lot, the parking spaces that will be off of Town Common Circle. And we'll be getting about half of those parking spaces for our residents. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll be giving you a little more information about parking in, in the, later in this presentation. Next slide. This is an image of our proposed building from uh, just in front of Town Hall, uh, looking kind of south and, and west, um, sorry, south and east. Um, in the, on the right-hand side is Dr. Jacobson's building, which it, that's rendered just as it's been drawn by the architect and approved. Um, and then in the middle is our proposed building, um, which is, as I said, 49 units. And um, we kind of create a sense of enclosure, we hope, um, for the village green, um, which right now just kind of goes, goes on and on. Um, next slide, please. So this is showing the building from a different orientation, um, looking from the south and, and looking more north and east. Um, as you approach Dr. Jacobson's building on the right, and then ours is in the rear. Um, and you can see a little bit better the architecture here. And what we're trying to do is to break down the size of the building um, to, to the size and the mass by, by making it move in and out um, on its front facade and on its, on its top. Um, so for example, there's a connector in the middle that um, is designed to, to be faced with porcelain tile that sets back from the, from the other faces of the building. And then the green portions sit farther forward and the white portions protrude even a little farther forward from that, um, again, to, to break down the size of the building. We are using very traditional architectural forms like gables and dormers and a pitched roof, all sort of in homage to um, traditional architectural forms that are found in Cape Elizabeth. We wanna, we wanna be a good neighbor and fit in visually. Um, but there's a little touch of the modern in this. Um, in, for example, the connector, as I mentioned, being faced with porcelain tile, um, that's a fairly modern material. And also the window pattern um, in the connector uh, is, is, some, is a little more modern than in the clabbered sections of the building that are green and white. Um, if we can go to the next slide, there's, you can see a little bit more detail of the building. This is just a, a straight on shot um, without seeing any of the village green. Um, or the town common circle. Um, and in the, in the, at the top of the connector is a, will be a roof deck. Um, well, if the project moved forward, would be a roof, roof deck that's common for all the residents. And on the third level would, would be a fitness studio, a fitness center um, with cardio machines and weights um, so that residents could, can work out and look out over, over the village green at the same time. Um, and then the, the first two stories of that connector would be a two-story entry, um, kind of uh, entry hall, hallway um, or, or um, front hall. Um, and, and so there would be a, a corridor down, down the long axis of the building in, inside with apartments on facing out the front um, from the direction we're looking right now, and then apartments facing the woods in the rear, looking out in the, in the opposite direction. Um, Next slide. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen to, to give you some information about the proposed project, which is kind of textual in nature rather than visual in nature. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so the proposed building would be 49 one bedroom apartments. Um, we work with main housing through their affordable housing program and 49 units is what makes this specific project financially work within that program. Um, but of those 49 apartments, we would propose that 39 of the units be set aside for people who are earning up to 60% of the area median income. And then the remaining 10 units would rent for um, any market rate tenant who could afford the rents. And what that means is these affordable apartments would be for a single person household, um, they would be earning up to $42,000 per year to qualify for the lower rent of just over $1,000. And the market rate units, people would be earning more than $42,000 and they, the rents we're expecting are $14.95. And those rents include hot water, wireless internet, the fitness center, community room, um, property management and resident services coordination and parking. Um, we've reviewed Cape Elizabeth's comprehensive plan, which is a great comprehensive plan that was just updated in 2019. Um, and the comprehensive plan noted two housing goals. Um, one was to promote a diversity of housing types to accommodate residents of all age groups and household sizes. And the second was to increase the amount of affordable housing through method, methods that minimize administrative burdens on town administration. Um, the comprehensive plan talked about how the town might need to focus on a shift in policy in order to incentivize the inclusion of affordable housing in development projects. Um, it noted that one third of CAPE homeowners were cost burdened, which means that they pay more than 30% of their income towards their housing expenses. And nearly half of the CAPE renters were in the same situation, paying more than 30% of their income towards their rent. And in 2010, there were about 21% of the seniors in Cape Elizabeth were living alone, which was an increase from prior years. Um, and it was noted that there was, they were likely living in homes that were much larger than they needed and that it kind of supported the, that there was a need for more housing that's smaller and more accessible so that seniors could maybe sell their homes but continue to live in Cape Elizabeth. One thing I would just add is that um, I forgot to mention when I was uh, reviewing the drawings is that the building would have an elevator, so it would be it would be fully handicapped accessible and and adaptable, and all the units would either be handicapped accessible or adaptable to if if they were lived in by a resident who needed, uh, who became you know, mobility impaired. So with the current zoning in the town center, this project won't work. Um, and so we would need a zone amendment for four different reasons. Um, the density, the height, the building footprint and the commercial space requirements. So for density, the current zone requires 3000 square feet of land per unit, which would allow for 26 apartments um, on the two lots that we're looking to purchase. And the amendment would allow us to achieve the 49 units. Um, the 49 units, again, is just what makes this project financially feasible with the main housing program. Um, but with both the 100 foot undeveloped wooded buffer and the village green that are in the front, you maintain that feeling of open space. Um, and we also have a, plenty of parking to support the increased density. Um, for the height, the current zone allows for 35 feet in height, and the amendment would allow for a height of 42 feet. Um, the 42 feet is so that we can get the fourth story on the building, which would allow for the 49 units that are needed. But when you factor in the grade change, um, when you travel from Route 77 straight back to where the building would be located, there's about a six foot decrease um, in the elevation there. So the building when set down that six feet wouldn't be any taller than town hall, which is the closest neighboring building on one side. Um, so it will not feel out of place in context. Um, also because of where the building is located, there would not be any shadow created on any of the neighboring buildings. Um, so there wouldn't be any solar loss to any of the neighbors. The current zoning for building footprint requires, um, it limits the footprint to 5,000 square feet, but it allows a connector to connect two different buildings. 
Um, the amendment would allow for our non-traditional connector um, because our connector has community space on the first floor in the back and three units that are in the upper levels in the back. It doesn't meet the definition of a connector, but we're sort of tipping our hat to the zoning requirement um, on the front of the building. As Nathan pointed out, we have that visual effect of a connector building in the front, um, but it still allows us to maximize our space and to achieve the 49 units that we need um, for the project. And for the commercial space, the current zoning requires that the first floor be reserved for commercial areas and the amendment would allow for housing on the first floor. Um, again, that's just to get to our 49 apartments that we need in order to um, make the project feasible. And we can't accomplish the 49 units unless we can put them on the entire first floor. Um, our site is furthest from the main road in the development, so um, it may not be noticeable that there's no commercial space. Um, and the project does provide a, a public benefit. Um, the, as the comprehensive plan indicates, Cape Elizabeth needs affordable housing, and 80% of our project would be set aside for affordable units. Um, for parking, we will be able to have 34 parking spaces on site, um, including several handicapped parking spaces. Um, and we're proposing to share use of up to 15 spaces behind town hall in order to be able to provide one parking space per apartment. Um, we're willing to create more parking behind town hall at our expense if it's determined that more parking is needed in order to accommodate our tenants. Um, park Parking sharing is allowed in the zoning and is used in other areas. Um, the planning board has approved the use of parking sharing in the past. Um, all one bedroom apartments means that there's less parking demand per unit. Um, that's what we've found from managing our buildings. And because the site is so walkable, there probably will be some tenants that don't have vehicles at all um, with the grocery store right across the street, um, town hall, the community center are all so close by. Um, the other thing that the project would need is an affordable housing TIF. Um, currently, the project has a gap of about $750,000, and that's a gap between the sources that we have and the expenses that we're expecting. And if we can't close that gap, then the project won't work. And so we're proposing a 30-year TIF where 65% of the TIF would be returned to the project. And those returned TIF funds would allow the project to take out an additional mortgage to close that $750,000 gap. Um, this TIF allows the town to keep all of the taxes that it's currently receiving on the property, plus it gets 35% of the increase in taxes during the TIF period. And again, all of the TIF proceeds go towards paying that additional mortgage. There's no additional profit to the property. This graph shows a breakdown of the sources. So we're expecting the project to be around $12.5 million. And the largest source of funding comes from uh, a mortgage that we get from main housing. And that's a must pay mortgage that we make monthly payments on. Um, and then the next big chunk, the 28% of the sources would come from the equity raised from the sale of tax credits. So the project is awarded tax credits from main housing that it sells to an equity investor and those funds are used as sources for the project. And then 25% um, would be an additional mortgage from main housing that's a deferred mortgage um, where no payments are made um, until at the end of 30 years when the lump sum is due all at once. And this small gold um, piece of the pie right here represents the additional amortizing mortgage that we would be able to take out because of the TIF proceeds. Um, so again, that's about $750,000 worth of value there. Um, the TIF benefits the town because it increases the land values and adds annually to the town coffers. And after the 30 year TIF period, the town receives the entire taxable value for the remainder of the time that the building is there. Um, it, the TIF makes possible the creation of 39 affordable rental housing units that we wouldn't be able to create otherwise. Um, the affordability restrictions on the building do remain in place for 45 years, so they do outlast the TIF um, quite a bit. And the project addresses a lot of the goals in the comprehensive plan, but it doesn't require the town to put out any cash outlay or to take on any debt. 
um, just to share in the increase in taxes. And it adds a lot of vitality to the town center. I think just to, just to add one point in terms of adding vitality to the town center is that if you have 50 plus people that are living within walkable distance of Pond Cove, it's gonna make a big difference for uh, all the tenants that occupy that, that building in that area. Um, and as, you know, as a resident of uh, Cape Elizabeth, and I'm sure as you guys know more than we do, or I do, uh, you know, that's filling up that space with tenants has always been a bit of a struggle. So the more people we can get in there, the better off we are. Um, this is just a bit about our, um, the timeline we're anticipating for the project. Um, so we know that we'll have several months to go through the various um, town approvals that are needed, but we're hoping to get those completed by, by August of this year. And then we would submit our main housing application very quickly after those approvals were received, so likely in September. And then once we get approval for main housing, we would start the full design work on the project, which takes about six months, and that would go from October to February. Um, and then we would need two more months to get to construction loan closing. So construction would start likely in April of 2022, or in just over a year from now. Um, construction is usually about a 14 month process. And so that would be done in June of 2023 and the tenants would start moving in right away. So um, that, that completes our, our slide presentation. I guess I would just like to say a couple of things. One is um, just to, to, be ab to be really clear about sort of where, where we stand with this. We're, we're in a three month, we, we have put those two lots under contract, um, but we have not purchased them. We have the right to purchase them um, for a, some, a period of time. And for the first three months of that period of time, we can, we're doing our so-called due diligence. Basically, we're doing research on this opportunity and this possibility to see whether it can work, um, in, including due diligence about the, the characteristics of the site, um, environmental, its environmental history, its, its uh, geotechnical characteristics, but also, frankly, sort of political due diligence to see whether the will is there on the part of the council um, to, to, to partner with us to make this happen. Um, we, have a, we have a large uh, earnest money deposit um, which becomes non-refundable on the 23rd of this month. And um, so by the tw on the 23rd or the day before the 23rd, we'll, we'll make a decision about whether we want to go forward or not. Um, and so hearing, hearing some from the council tonight will really help us understand kind of, frankly, whether this can fly. Um, we realize that we're asking a lot. Um, we're asking a lot in terms of, of, of zoning adjustment and also a TIF, um, but we also think that we would be bringing a lot to the town and bringing a lot to the table. Um, and so we're, we're eager to hear your thoughts and, and questions um, about the project but then we're eager to get a sense from you of whether you think that this is a direction that you'd like us to go or whether you would not interested in it, in which case we, we can end it um, and all we will have lost will have been some time. So I think with that, I'll turn it back to, to the chair. Nathan, um, thank you, uh, both you and Christy uh, and um, and Bobby as well for the information and the presentation. Um, uh, very clear and, and thoughtfully presented and um, appreciate the detail you're able to provide for both the council that I think have a good understanding of um, you know, your concept and vision um, and also give a little bit of an introduction to anybody from the, from the public that's joining. Um, before opening it up to um, any questions or comments from counselors as well as um, any comments from the public, I'm going to turn it over to Matt for just a moment, um, just to um, talk a little bit about um, TIFFs and the process involved in that and um, uh, sort of that side of the equation as far as, um, as, as that uh, impacts, uh, you know, further discussion on this. So, Matt. Sure. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd be happy to. Yes. Uh, what uh, what uh, the concept that was brought forward was, was an affordable housing TIF which is something that was created by the legislature uh, by specific legislation a number of years back. Uh, some towns have employed that. I know uh, 
of note recently Scarborough has used this as a tool to cre create affordable housing within Scarborough and they've been very successful uh, using this as a tool. With, uh, with this property here, it currently is in the town center TIF. So what we'd be looking at that would be ultimately uh, a couple of different actions we would wanna pursue, which would be uh, amending the current town center TIF and possibly uh, one thought would be to extract these two parcels from that, uh, the, the town center district TIF and then creating a new TIF specific to these two parcels. That's probably, probably going to be the cleanest way because uh, uh, the current TIF we have, I think is a 20 year uh, town center TIF and uh, this would be a 30 year uh, product for uh, lack of a better term to describe. So, and you can have it a lot cleaner with the language and the expectations that the town would want as well as uh, the, the, the terms of the uh, of the TIF agreement, as well as the credit enhancement agreement, spelling out, uh, as, as Kristen had uh, noted, the 30, uh, 65% being paid back to the development uh, to help with the debt service, and then the 35% being retained by the town. So uh, in, in that sense, for, uh, for every dollar that would be paid, in this case, 65 cents would come back to the, to the development to help offset the debt service. Meanwhile, the town would receive 35 cents out of every dollar. Which is, you know, oftentimes uh, uh, it's a 100% credit enhancement agreement is what uh, they, you find in other towns. So this is uh, something that helps the town, at least uh, under these terms, it would help the town uh, address the issues that it would have that might be related to uh, providing services, uh, public safety being one, uh, and other other public charges. So uh, that helps support it. And then ultimately, when uh, that that TIF becomes uh, ripe or expires after 30 years, then that 100% of all the proceeds would then come, come to the town. Also during that time period, uh, the investment of, of what goes into the town's coffers or the town's uh, tax assessment is sheltered from that. So it would, it would, uh, it would shelter that value from say uh, such things as state valuation where they uh, make the determination for uh, general purpose aid to education as well as uh, impact on the county uh, tax bill as well. So that it shelters those, that investment from, from, uh, from those two bills as well uh, going forward. So uh, it's something that could be done. We've done uh, the most recent one. The only one that we have is currently in the town center. So uh, we would go through the same process uh, and work with the DECD to get that, uh, to get the approvals in place and, uh, and go through that. And, and we would use, uh, you know the town's attorneys to help us get through that process, but uh, it's it's a very it's been a very successful model uh, across the state, and uh, like I said, most notably in Scarborough, uh, close by. Matt, what does that process look like, both from a, a sort of order of operations, and then just overall timing of that too? And and I ask as it relates to Nathan's comments, you know, just they're outlining their overall project timetable and 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 some shorter term um, need for knowing which way the wind is blowing on this? Well, uh, it ultimately gets, it needs to be approved by the town council. So we would do due diligence on the legal side, uh, work with work with Nathan and uh, Robert and, and, and Kristen on this to get uh, the details that we needed to have, as well as with the town's attorney to, to craft the document, provide that up to DCD for their review and uh, an, an initial approval, and then would come back to, it ha would have to be formalized by the town and then sent up ultimately for approval by the state. But uh, it's a fairly, it's a fairly linear process, uh, for lack of a better term, but you do need to have, you know, it would have to be endorsed by the council and approved, but it could work within the, uh, within the schedule and the calendar that was identified. Um. Before I open it up for um, public comment, is, is there anybody from the council that has uh, more specifically uh, looking for questions or, or things people might be looking to clarify at this point um, versus getting into council discussion on this? Uh, mainly want to take advantage of the developers um, uh, time here to, to ask if you've got questions or things you're looking to have clarified, and then I'm going to turn it over to to have the public have an opportunity to um, either make comments or ask any questions. And then following that, we can, I think, wrap this agenda item with, with more council discussion, if that works for everybody. So 
Um, so I'll start, like I said, is, is there anybody on the council side that has um, any questions or things that they're not clear about or uh, things of that sort? Go ahead, Councilor Boucher. I just wanted to know if you could expand a little bit on why the decision for one bedrooms and not a mix of multiple um, sizes of units and talk more about the feasibility of the financial picture there and why that decision was made. Sure. Kristen, do you want to, do you want to start out with that? Sure. Um, the main reason we chose all one bedroom apartments was because of how sort of pinched we are for space. Um, we needed 49 apartments for it to work. And because we've sort of gone out as much as we can, and we've gone up sort of higher than we were allowed by zoning, um, we didn't really have any room to add any additional bedrooms to the project. Um, I'd say that's the main reason. Um, yeah. I, I would, I, I would just add to, that is the main reason. I would ask, add to that, that we have found in our other projects that the units that are most in demand, the apartment type that is most in demand is one bedrooms. Um, there's basically an undersupply of one bedrooms in the greater Portland area. Um, because household sizes have fallen, have continued to fall decade after decade. Um, if you think back to like the 1950s, the people had larger families and extended families often lived together more than they do now. Now people are, tend more to live, young adults tend to live alone more. Um, there's more divorce than there was. Um, it's less likely that an elderly parent, for example, will live in the same actual housing unit with their their adult children. Um, and um, so there's so older older dwellings tend to be larger than what the the market is demanding. And, and there's not enough of smaller dwellings. And that's so that's part of what we're trying to do here. I also think that particular, you know, one bedroom, it reflects what, uh, you know, the elderly uh, demographic uh, is here in Cape Elizabeth. So that there's you know, a lot of folks who are, are getting older and growing out of their houses and looking for a place to go. And so one bedrooms is the appropriate, um, you know, uh, facility for them. It's also more affordable than two and three bedrooms. We've, we've found in our other projects that a lot of one bedrooms, just to build on what Bobby was just saying, a lot of our one bedrooms are occupied by a couple, a couple who have downsized out of a small home that they may have owned for decades. Um, and they just can't keep, they can't uh, keep mowing the lawn and weeding the garden and shoveling snow and they wanna get into a place where they don't have to do any of that. Um, it, so a, a large, people vacating a large home wouldn't, wouldn't go into a one bedroom typically. We don't really see that, but people vacating a small, you know, ranch or like a 1,200 square foot or 1,000 square foot ranch, um, which do exist in Cape Elizabeth, um, quite a few of them, um, could definitely go into a six or, or 700 square foot one bedroom. Thank you. Um, I I had a quick question, and I, I don't know if it got further clarified, and and it it, it might be we're saying the same thing, but. Um, uh, just stated a different way, but I, I remember when, when we spoke earlier, uh, I had the question about the zoning ordinance pertaining to number of units per square foot, but um, being confused about whether or not the language in that ordinance uh, was specifically uh, descriptive of the number of bedrooms that were represented in those units. So I, I think I think what I've, see, what I've seen in your updated material here tonight is that based on units per square foot, that, that, that's basically, is that saying the same thing, but just in, in a different way? Yeah, or? right. So it says that for every 3,000 square feet, you can have one unit, but it doesn't specify what that unit is. So you could have a three right. bedroom unit or a one bedroom unit or a studio, mm -hmm. and those all just count as one unit per 3,000 square foot. So, right. so, so it, in theory, you could get more bedrooms for the density and have more people. Councilor Gabrielson. Um, uh, thank, thank you, Jamie. Um, I guess um, I, my question in line with your comment on process for t the TIF, um, and maybe this is a question that's best answered by, by Maureen, um, but my question is um, 
So assuming that the council wants to move ahead with this project and, and look at making the changes to accommodate it, uh, what would that process look like? Is this a development of a contract zone that would apply just to these properties or would this be an amendment to the underlying town center zone to accommodate this use? Um, what's, the, what's the process to move this forward? Yeah, I'm glad you asked it that way, um, Jeremy, because th that's more specifically, and I'll come to you for that in a minute, Matt. That's more specifically what um, I was trying, I, I think, to get to, um, to the point of what action do we need to take if we're to satisfy the ask from the developer here about, um, you know, having a sense of whether or not there's support or not for this, but obviously, I, you know, without um, you know, without being in a position to, to fully bind ourselves to any, any uh, commitment absent those other steps have been executed. So Matt, I know you just, you know, elevated Maureen up into the panel. Um, so if either of you want to speak to that, go ahead. So Matt, you okay if I go ahead? Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, please step forward. <laughs> Well, Matt and I had a brief discussion today about next steps if this was something that the council felt favorably towards. And I, I think you are correct in that we've got an aggressive timeline. Um, and for that reason, um, the town does not have contract zoning. It was considered at one point, it was uh, very firmly rejected. So uh, my suspicion is the best way to handle this would be a straightforward zone change. And in order to uh, move this along as quickly as possible, the, zone, the zoning would have to be changed. The planning board has to be involved in that. So I think the council could actually refer this directly to the planning board and tell them to get back to you as quickly as possible with the amendments that are needed. Um, and I, I mean, obviously everyone's gonna have to work fairly quickly, but it would be, a straightforward amendment. Uh, I um, had the privilege of, of talking to this developer. I, I have a concept in mind. I'm happy to bring it forward um, if, if that's what the council wants to do. Thank you. Jeremy, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, that answers my question perfectly. Thank you. I, I guess my question, you know, pointedly to the developers is, um, for, for the date that you're speaking of, um, you know, with your deposit and everything um, coming up at the end of the month, um, I guess what what you know if, what what percentage of confidence are you hoping to achieve um, through these discussions to feel sure. good about moving forward or not? So because I I think what what I'm what I'm sensing is um, you know potentially a, an interest to work. Um, to further explore this, but also, you know, um, a desire to to move relatively cautiously and, and not, um, you know, upend, uh, you know, precedent and decisions around zoning um, just for the for the sake of expedience here. So, can you can you go into that a little bit further about sort of what, you know, what level of confidence you need to to keep moving forward? Yeah, I'll speak to it, and 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 Bobby or Kristen, please add if you if you have anything. Uh, else. Um, we've known all along that, that tonight's meeting would be a workshop, not a, not a public hearing and not a right. vote. So we've, we've never been expecting a, 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 the, the council to go on record with a vote tonight. Um, what we've just been hoping is that through discussion, that, that through discussion among the counselors in this meeting, uh, it, it, that we would get, we would sort of get a sense of the meeting, if you will, um, a, a sense of you 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 use the analogy, uh, Jamie, of, of you know where, which way the winds are blowing. That's we're just trying to get a sense of, you know, is is the is it is it a favorable wind or an ill wind at this point? Um, and I think and I think we're willing to take risk. Um, we don't we're not trying to squeeze all the risk out of it tonight. We're just trying to squeeze a little bit of risk out of it so that we don't we're not proceeding essentially blind. Uh, we'd like if if we, yeah. if there could if you could you know put on the table for the council. How are, how are you guys feeling about this? And just allow us to listen to how counselors are feeling about it. That, that would be very, very helpful in, in helping us understand whether we should proceed on beyond February 23rd or not. 
And just, and just to add to that, I, I would say, you know, we're aware that we're, you know, are asking for a lot of changes here. And so we really appreciate the, the fact that you're, you're willing to listen to us on that score. But I, I think the biggest issue for us, as Jason said, is if there are any roadblocks or major roadblocks that you see that would uh, be prevent us from doing this project over the long run, would really like to know that sooner rather than later. I think the, what I would add is that um, the timeline we laid out was really just a, a very, you know, it's a template, it's not hard deadlines. The application process to mean housing is a flexible, there's no deadline for application, it's a rolling application. So if this process through the town takes us an extra month, that's not going to implode the project in any way. Um, the, the only sort of hard deadline we have is the, the due diligence period we have before we, um, our money goes hard on the purchase and sale, but yeah. everything else is very flexible depending on how it works within the town process. Do other councillors have any questions they want to raise at this time? Councillor Devereaux. Um, I want to thank you for your presentation and I, I want to let everyone know that um, Mr. Zanton and associates um, reached out to me and I think to other counselors, and we did have a meeting um, before this meeting, they did not ask um, how I was going to vote, but they did give me the presentation and I'm guessing they met with other counselors. So I wanted to let everybody know that. Um, Thank you, Councilor Devereaux, appreciate that. I'm just curious, um, something that we didn't talk about, you're asking the town basically for us to subsidize this by $750,000. And your graph shows credits and money coming in from other places. I'm curious what your investment is in this project. And, and how, if we're going to do a lot of things here, like change the zoning, um, really put a big investment toward this, what is your investment in this? Um, sure, uh, well, I'll start out and again, Ask my compatriots to 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 add 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 on to what I'm saying. Um, if if you have anything to add, um, we invest a lot of time into into this. Um, it's a very time consuming process. Um, um, we um, we also make guarantees. Um, we we guarantee so to our our funders and our financers. We guarantee construction completion so that if if our contractor can't or won't is unable to complete construction we financially guarantee that we'll bring in another contractor to complete it um, even if that means more expense you know at our own expense we also make operating guarantees to our um, our funders so that in other words if the project ends up losing money we guarantee that we will dig into our own pockets to to make it whole um, so that our funders so that it doesn't get foreclosed on or um, cease operations, um, which would be de detrimental to our investors and our funders, our, our lenders. So we make so we make a variety of guarantees and we put in a lot of time. I would say that's that's our, and we also use we, our money. We, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think okay. one of the other. You think, go ahead, Bobby. You you can. Well, I think we also have what's called pre-development money, and that's the money that, that gets put in um, prior to the point of closing, which goes in over a series of months. And, and Nate and I, you know, put all that money up. And if the project doesn't go forward, uh, then, you know, we lose that money. And that can be in a project this size, that would be probably somewhere around two hundred dollars to $250,000. Okay. But if it does go forward you get that money back. So you're not really if, investing if, any money into the project is what I'm hearing. Right, we're not, we're not investing money permanently in the project, right? Okay, all right. I was curious about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other Thanks. council questions, Councilor Noonan? Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question about how that rent restricted rent is calculated, like how, how is the size of the unit a factor at all, or is it just a straight like income percentage of income or something? So yeah, so um, the income limits that we mentioned that that forty two thousand dollars ish a year for one person, those income limits are released annually by Main Housing and HUD, and they are 
determined by the area. So Cape Elizabeth is included in the Portland Cumberland County area. So it's the same income limits you would see in Portland. Um, and that is based on the number of people who live in a unit. So a two person household would have a higher income limit, so on and so forth. The, the rents are determined by bedroom size and those are determined by the same um, agency. And they're basically designed so that the rent would not exceed 30% of the income of the average person living in that unit. Um, and then there's something called the utility allowance, which is probably getting a little bit too much in the weeds, but because in um, you, the tenants have to pay for some of their own utilities, the rents are lowered even more to allow the tenant to pay their own utilities. So if all utilities were included, those rents would be a little bit higher. And for everything that's not included, the rents continue to go down. Um, and those are updated every year. So depending on what happens in that geographic location, the rents could go up or down depending on what happens in the market. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions from anybody? Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna open it up and I, there we go. Uh, I'm gonna open it up to uh, questions from the public. Um, if you could just give us your name, uh, address or affiliation um, when you are called on, uh, you can, uh, if you have something you wanna um, speak to, you can use the raise hand function uh, in Zoom here. Um, not gonna be super strict about the three minutes, but if, if you could try and keep your comments relatively brief, um, that would be great. So um, the first person I see with a hand raised is uh, Victoria Valent. So uh, Victoria, when Matt gets, his, gets your mic open, um, go right ahead, please. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, you can hear me? Loud and clear, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanna say this it appears to be a great project. This is exactly when I was sitting on the comp plan and we were thinking about the town center, we were thinking about diversifying housing. This is rental, diversifying housing. Uh, these are one bedrooms. You don't see too many one bedrooms that will bring in the elderly. And, and that's great because we do want housing for our elderly. We want housing for young people. This will be affordable. This is exactly what we were talking about when we had a vision for the town center. As far as uh, a map amendment, the zoning that will have to take place, going higher is not a bad thing in your town center. That is, especially, we're only talking a height of less than 45 feet, 42 feet. Um, and so that's good. Density, don't be afraid of density. Density is a good thing. Um, and this is what you want in your town center. Try to think someday when that strip mall across the street is gone, what would you like to see there? And these are the type of projects you would want to see there, something that has this type of vision. So I think this is a wonderful project. I do hope that um, you go forward with this. Um, it's just great, I can't say enough. This reminds me a lot of uh, the Mother House, if you're familiar with the project in Portland. Uh, that's a great project, one bedroom units, uh, filled right up. If they had more units, they could have filled that one, even more units, great project. Uh, and that's what it reminds me of. And it also, uh, 178 Kennebec, another Zanton project that's gonna fill right up. These are in huge demand. I see these projects filling up all the time so quickly. And this is what I do for a living. Uh, and that's why I'm so enthused about this. Uh, for Nathan, uh, Nathan, I did wanna know, I, I, I didn't quite catch the AMI level for the different bedroom units because then um, I'll know what the uh, maximum rent is for whether, um, and I'll also know the income qualifications based on that. That's a simple chart that will give that information. And I'm also assuming, um, is this a 4% tax credit project? And those are all yes. my thoughts. Yep, so the, the affordable units would be set aside for the 60% of area median income um, to answer that question. And then yes, this would be part of the 4% um, main housing program. Yeah, just, and just to build on that, um, for, the, for those who may not know as much about area median income limits, um, what Kristen's referring to is that the, the 39 affordable units would be for households whose income is, is at 60% of the area median income or less. So it doesn't have to be right at 60%, it's, it's 60 or below. 
And that 60% for a one person household, correct me if I'm wrong, Kristen, is about 42,000. Around there, yeah. Right. right, and and so if it was a two person household, it would be higher than that. It would be more like 45 or 46,000. That would be the upper limit for those affordable units. <laughs> and one one thing that, um, People often don't understand about the about the, the affordable housing tax credit program, which is what what we're talking about here, is that assets are not valued very highly in terms of how they translate into presumed income. So, for example, a couple can have sold a, a home in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, let's say they don't have a mortgage on it anymore. And it sells for let's a small home sells for let's say three hundred thousand. They put that money in the bank. That only counts for something like a one thousand six hundred dollars of annual income. So if if this this couple other you know if they, if their social security or a small pension and that sixteen hundred dollars doesn't add up to more than forty five or forty six thousand dollars a year, then they're eligible for that lower rent apartment. Thanks for that additional clarification, Nathan. Um, Thank you for your comments, Victoria. Um, I assume your comments are concluded. Um, your, your mic is still on. Okay, actually, um, I did want to just point out how the TIF does work. When um, it was stated that the town would be putting up $750,000, I just want to make um, people realize that this is not coming out of anyone's pocket in Cape Elizabeth. This is a $12.5 million project you uh, will have a new tax assessment and that tax that will be paid, part of it goes to the developer to cover this and part will go to the town. There is no uh, money going from town coffers into uh, this project. It's all based on tax revenue and that won't be going 100% to the town coffers until year 30. And um, so I just want to make that clear when you're asking, what is this going to cost? Actually, because it's $12.5 million and you'll be getting 45% of that revenue, you're making money. This is not costing the town money. Thank you very much. Thanks for your comments, Ms. Flint. Um, next in the queue is David Jacobson. Uh, David, when Matt gets your mic open, uh, if you could just give us name and address and go ahead. Thank you. You guys can hear me okay? Yes. Loud and clear, go ahead. Uh, I'm David Jacobson. I own the, the property next to the town hall and uh, the Zanton company has it under contract. So I'm here to just throw some support. I think it's, uh, first of all, the presentation was very well done. Very rarely have I seen uh, some presentations done this well, but the overall feel of what they're trying to propose fits very well in the town center. Um, I was extremely impressed by their schematics and the design, the initial design that they have proposed. Um, and I also feel that it just checks off so many boxes. Um, with their reputation in Maine is second to none as far as affordable housing. And I just don't see Cape Elizabeth having another opportunity for this to be done elsewhere in the center of town. If, if they can't do it, you know, two other buildings are gonna go in there and I, you know, I just don't see another area that can uh, propose this type of project that's going to be um, opening up a lot of single family homes in Cape Elizabeth once people downsize and move in, especially with their um, the added density that they're trying to get, which I think is uh, just a great, great advantage for, for affordable housing and some opening up more market rate apartments, which is desperately needed in Cape Elizabeth. So just want to um, th throw my support behind the Zanton group and the uh, um, great proposal that they, they put on today. Hope you guys support the project. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Jacobson. Um, 
our uh, next up is uh, Dheeraj Kari, or no, I'm sorry, Paul, Paul S. I assume Paul Seidman, um, you were next in the queue. Sorry, Paul. Hi, a few ahead, comments. Um, Can we get your address, Paul, real quick? Yeah, sure, 21 Oakview Drive, Paul Seidman. Thanks, Paul. Um, a few thoughts. I, my understanding of, of uh, some desires from the public um, that, that this wouldn't meet. Um, for one thing, uh, commercial uh, or businesses that bring the community together, uh, like the Lumbery, um, that would be one level where that may not get to exist. Um, the, it rules out single parents, um, or it appears to rule out single parents with one bedroom. Um, I'm curious about the ethnic breakdown of who occupies one bedroom apartments, um, because another concern is expanding various kinds of diversity in town. And um, what else? Uh, with regard to all the changes, I, I understand the thing about spot zoning, but it, it seems more bizarre to change a whole lot of laws really quickly that wouldn't be changed as quickly were it not for one development. That just seems problematic. Not that some of those don't need to change, but that speaks to another concern, which is it takes a while for the public to kind of catch up and get involved. And any one of these changes would be something a lot of the public would want to discuss. Having them all happen at once seems like um, just a lot. I mean, not that they haven't acknowledged, not that everybody hasn't acknowledged exactly the same thing. And, um, you know, I'm aware of trends showing that seniors are also wanting to stay put and then create in-law apartments and it allows for, you know, more companionship um, and assistance for elders. So there are just a series of concerns. I think um, I'll, I'll just emphasize the, the fact that this rules out single parents, I think is, is unfortunate. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your comments, Paul. Um, so next up, uh, is uh, Dheeraj Kare. Go ahead, your name and address for the minutes, please. Oh, your mic might be muted on your end. Can you hear me now? There you go. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Um, my name is Dheeraj Kare from 2920 Road. Um, so just some thoughts here. So adding affordable housing to Cape would be a great start. Um, so I'm thinking more about, you know, catering to families with young kids. Um, so I have a question about like the occupancy in one bedroom. Um, so like, what's the limit? So, and then whether it will really attract families with young children, you know, with low income uh, to the Cape neighborhood to, to use the, the schools, which are, you know, excellent schools we have here. Um, and on a second note, I'm just curious, is there any thought of having two bedroom units uh, with affordable housing or affordable prices? Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys can um, answer these questions. Thanks, I think um, not to speak for the developer, I, I think that, that was covered a little bit in their presentation about how the one bedrooms and creating the, um, uh, the number of total units that they described in their proposal um, was factored into the financial viability of the project. So, um, oh, so I just meant, sorry, uh, the occupancy, like in one bedroom, how many folks can stay? Right. Um, yeah. So that is sometimes just a code rule, depending on the municipality, but in other places like in Portland, we quite often it is single people or couples, but we do um, we do quite often see single parents residing in one bedroom apartments with one small child. Um, oftentimes, the parent will give the bedroom to the child and then use the living room as the as the adult's bedroom, and that certainly is something we see in our properties. Um, 
And as long as the municipal zoning um, allows for that, that, that would be allowed within the building as well. I would just add to that that we realize that there are there are family types that really need two bedrooms and three bedrooms, and we we just we know that we can't satisfy all the needs that are out there in one development, um, but we know that there is tremendous need for what we are proposing, and we know it would fill up very quickly, very quickly. Um, so essentially, it's it's impossible for one one development to be you know all things to all people that are needed. Um, we have, you have to, it takes a patchwork of different developments, but, and this is really just one. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Um, next up is uh, John Volts. John, if you could give your name and address for the minutes when yep. Matt gets your mic up. Go ahead, John, I hear you. Have you heard? Yep, go ahead. Great. Um, so first of all, I was, I, I'm highly supportive of the, the project as it stands. I think um, increasing housing and density, particularly in town center, is uh, extremely advantageous to the community. Um, one of the questions I sort of had for uh, the council and the uh, Maure Maureen, the planning board, if she's still on, is just to put in perspective, the number of affordable housing units that have been added to the housing stock in Cape Elizabeth over the last year or even 10 years, because my my recollection from the things that I, bits that I've seen is it's actually not that much. Um, and we've all seen that we should be doing more and sort of putting that in context, I think it's really uh, important. Um, uh, again, I think the the when you look at town centers, things like density and height are often pluses, not minuses, and making accommodations to them in zoning is quite sensible. Um, I, you know, th th that said, I'm it's very supportive as it is. I have two, the two concerns I, I do have are um, I, I think um, not having um, retail incorporated. Um, is a little bit of a risk because I think that having ground floor retail does add to the vibrancy of your town center. Um, I understand the economics on this won't work, but a thought as to how you're going to want to integrate ground level retail within that town uh, square area, I think is important. And the other thing that I would suggest based on comments tonight and also just offering a diversity of housing is um, consider offering a mix of studio apartments, which would be even lower cost and if a few of those along with two bedroom apartments, which would allow you to allocate something so you have a zero bedroom apartment and a two bedroom apartment without being without actually having to change the number of units and you have more diversity of housing already built into the project. But I'm delighted um, and I, I hope that um, all other winds that continue to blow are favorable and highly supportive of what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, John. Um, Next up is Aaron Plummer. Go Hi ahead, Aaron. You're, can you just Hi. give us your address for the minutes? So I'm living over in the Woodland South Apartments and I am mm -hmm. a single mother. And I understand that for this particular project, it really doesn't work to have, um, you know, multiple bedrooms. And, you know, that doesn't make me completely opposed to, to the project. It, looks beautiful. Um, I was living in the Woodland South apartments prior to them being sold a couple of years ago. And at that time, um, my oldest was about six and I had a baby. So that worked pretty well in a two bedroom apartment. You know, I had the baby sleeping in the room with me. Um, when the apartment complex was sold, the rents, you know, went up, but they weren't upgrading anything yet. And so, you know, and because my baby was starting to get older, we moved um, to another rental house in Cape Elizabeth, which was great. It was right up by the school. Um, we weren't even there a year before the owner decided with the market the way it is to sell. So, you know, I was being kicked out in a pandemic and I couldn't find a single thing. Um, and then finally something was open again at Woodland. Um, so now we're back here and I have an almost 11 year old and a four year old and a two bedroom and it really doesn't work. So, you know, I understand for this project, um, 
you know, it's probably not going to, to help people like me. And I know there are other families in this complex that are dealing with the exact same thing. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate like the need that we have, not everybody is interested in owning a home. The, the market is really crazy. It's hard for, you know, me on a single income, um, to look at buying something. It would be great if, if seniors were downsizing and then renting their homes. Um, you know, but yeah, so I just wanted to share that and, um, you know, thanks for the presentation. Thanks for your comments, Aaron. Um, Priscilla Dryman is next up. And uh, Priscilla's is the last hand I see raised. Um, if there's anybody else that wants to speak on this, um, I see a couple others going up. Um, just for counsel, uh, I'm hoping to kind of wrap up the public comment on this relatively shortly, get into a somewhat brief discussion of the council and then try and have this entire um, agenda item be wrapped up, um, hopefully not too far past 8.30 because we do have two other things to move on to here. So um, just wanted to do kind of a time check on the meeting here, but um, Priscilla, you're next up, your mic's open. If you could just give us your address, please. Um, I'm Pastor Priscilla Draymond and I'm the minister at Cape Elizabeth United Methodist Church at 280 Ocean House Road. I'm familiar with um, some of the Zantin build buildings in Portland and have always been impressed with them architecturally and functionally and also um, the div diverse clientele that they have been providing housing for. So I'm very excited about them being the builders and the designers. Um, as somebody who's right down the street, our congregation, um, I would see this bringing enormous new life to the town center and a really great opportunity for the town. Within our own church, um, seniors who have had to downsize um, and sell their homes have not been able to afford to stay in town. And almost without exception, they've been moving to Scarborough, South Portland, Westbrook, um, and so another issue is just losing our, our residents as they grow older. Um, I think this is very exciting. I think some really great points have been brought up. It would be wonderful if, if a single parent uh, could, could uh, be, be there with one child. It would be terrific. That other idea of maybe there being um, studios and then, and then also two bedrooms. I mean, that's another great idea. But I would very much encourage you to move forward on this. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Eliza Matheson. Um, go ahead, Eliza. And if you could, your address, please. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, my name is Eliza Matheson. I am at 270 Fowler Road. Um, and I'm sorry to be logging in somewhat late to the conversation. I just wanted to uh, throw my support behind uh, a project that it seems like in what I've been hearing um, makes an effort to diversify our housing options here in Cape Elizabeth, as well as um, uh, kind of sprucing up the town center to um, make it more accessible and um, community friendly as well. I don't have much more to add, except that I'm in full support of a project like that and future projects. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, Melanie Thomas, you're up next. Um, go ahead, Melanie, and if you could, your address, please. Hi, my name is Melanie Thomas, and I live at Six Starboard Drive. Um, I co-chair the Cape Diversity um, Committee and or civil rights committee, excuse me. Um, I, I'm nervous. So I first just wanna say that that was a fantastic presentation. Um, probably one of the best I've seen. Uh, I did hear about this and I was a little disappointed uh, when I went to uh, look at the agenda um, and, and see that they were only one bedrooms. Um, I happen to be a single disabled mom um, and uh, affordable housing is very important, as well as many things here in Cape. Um, I am for this project. Um, I'm just, I, I have concerns about um, how quick it needs to be implemented. Um, 
So I'm just mindful of that and concerned about that. Um, 22 days seems uh, rather quick. And um, I'm actually curious to see if this gets done and then what it could mean for projects um, moving forward um, that could be a little more steadfast as well. So, you know, my, my only concern would be I like the idea of maybe looking into having two bedrooms. Uh, truth be told, I, I would want it to be a three bedroom. I do have two kids. Um, but, you know, I'm just more interested in seeing what else can be done in this community to keep um, the citizens that we have here already. And the main need truly is um, parents that have kids and they want to stay here but can't afford to be here um, and trying to keep the good people that we have here already here. Um, the, the one bedroom just seems to be more um, bringing in a certain demographic that I, I just, I'm not saying it's not needed here. I'm just saying um, a need of affordable housing that can help families is truly a huge need here. Um, but I support this project. It looks great. It sounds great. I think it's going to be good for this town. Um, but there are other areas that I would love to see addressed and affordable housing is one and having two or three bedroom um, apartments would be amazing to see um, in the future. So that's all I want to say. Thank you for hearing me. Thanks, Molly. I just want to quickly respond to the comment you made about the time um, to, to move forward with this. And, and I, I, anybody from the development team, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I when we asked these questions earlier, I think the answer that was given um, was that um, it, it's not that there's full approvals even being um, sought um, you know, on the end of February timeframe. Um, and, you know, there is an understanding about the amount of work that, and time that it takes to move through, um, you know, the amendments and approvals process working with the planning board and so on, but that um, with your, um, you know, skin in the game that you've got so far, uh, your desire was to, to have some level of confidence that there was um, a measure of support in place and, and that that was, you know, further risk that you were willing to take on um you know to continue to move forward or not if that if that um didn't look like it was the case but i just don't want the public to have the impression that um anything is being jammed through or rushed um without thought and thoroughness um because that's that's not i don't think we're where we landed on that issue but um again anybody from i'm, I'm seeing heads nod and and yeah that's so. that's right that's right councillor uh, chair garvin uh, we're we are not at all asking for this to be wrapped up by February 23rd, um, not at all. We realize that this would be a multi-month process through the winter, spring, and probably some into the summer. Um, but we just, we're just looking for a kind of an informal feedback from counselors about yeah. how, how, how they are reacting to this proposal. Thank you. Um, Audra Gore uh, is next up with the hand raised. And again, now I see Audra is the last one. So if there's nobody else after her, we'll, we'll have a quick um, round of discussion amongst the council and then move on to our next agenda item. So Audra, if you could just um, give us your address, your microphone's open. Thank you. I'm Audra Gore, 215 Two Lights Road. Um, thinking about the comprehensive plan and promoting diversity of housing types to accommodate residents of all age groups and household sizes is really where I find myself excited for this project and then also hesitant because it, it does diversify. At the same time, it's meeting a very narrow group of our citizens and their needs. So it feels important to me that this isn't the end of the bigger goal, that this is just one piece of the bigger pie that we're looking at. Um, I too had the experience of single mom, the house that I was renting sold out from under us. And uh, luckily my son's dad was resident in Cape Elizabeth, so he's still able to attend school, but I commuted from Bath for two years, driving him every day back and forth to school. So it's the community and the desire to be here and, and what's here is so important and for there to be opportunity for 
all age groups and all household sizes um, is important. This does feel like it meets a really specific need. Um, and it, so that's what's on my mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Audra. Um, I don't see, like I said, any other hands raised. So I'm going to, if there, if there isn't anybody else that wants to make a comment at this time, I'm going to close the public comment uh, portion on this particular agenda item. Um, Councillor Jordan, is your hand raised? Yes, it is. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I just want to echo um, uh, Victoria's comments about the comprehensive plan and the work that we did during the comprehensive plan. And this project uh, really is uh, the type of project that we uh, envisioned uh, as we were doing uh, the comprehensive plan. And, and, and I look at this project uh, from an income diversity perspective, uh, housing options for um, you know singles, uh, uh, older people, uh, people older than me, um, and I also look at it that the density is what we're looking for in the town center in order to really bring the energy to the town center we need in order to have vibrant businesses. We aren't going to have vibrant businesses until we have uh, the, uh, the, the people walking around, going to the shops uh, and, and really engaging in uh, the town center. I see this project as something that we've envisioned uh, for many years and um, I, it's something that I could uh, get behind. Thanks, Penny. Uh, other counselors want to weigh in uh, or, or uh, any discussion points you want to raise? Jeremy, I saw your hand up. Um, yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, I, I fully agree with what Penny said. I think this looks like a great project. Um, I think that um, I'm, I'm very impressed with the presentation. I think this will fit really nicely into the town center. I like um, just architecturally what they've done with the massing so that you know, you have what is a, a relatively large building, but it really, it looks like something that will fit really nicely in the town center and bring a lot more people into our, our downtown. Um, and I think that's fantastic. Um, my one sort of concern with all of the things that the developers have brought forward is thinking about the, the zone amendment around um, first floor commercial use. Um, and especially if we're thinking about that as something that would apply across the town center district, I would wanna make sure that we could pay attention to crafting that in a way so that uh, we don't lose that in the town center. I, I, I think I, I, I appreciate the developer's perspective and I agree with them that I don't think, uh, I think this would fit in nicely without first floor retail. I think it's set back far enough from the road that I don't think you really necessarily miss that curb appeal here. Um, but thinking about the town center as a whole, I'd like to think about how we can craft, how we could craft that zoning amendment to make sure that for those parcels and places where that first floor retail is vital to the, the business essence of the of the town center zone that we don't lose that in the future but with i i think we can do that um and so yeah i i think this looks like a, a fantastic opportunity thanks jeremy uh councilor noonan yep i'm sorry uh i hope i didn't distract with my enthusiastic nodding but i <laughs> i uh pretty much completely agree with what jeremy just said um I'm really excited about the idea of having uh, this diversity. Um, I do wanna agree with something that Audra had mentioned that this is maybe one piece of the puzzle. I definitely think we all can agree that there are other things we can be doing to increase diversity, you know, through, you know, 
lot sizes and there, there are definitely other ways. Um, as Mr. Zanton said, this is not supposed to be all things to all people, but it definitely is a really great piece of the puzzle. But I also agree with Jeremy that my concern is, as Penny was saying, having people walking around going to the shops, I wanna make sure there's still shops downtown for people <laughs> to walk to. And that if we uh, get rid of that first floor retail requirement that it's not just suddenly all we get downtown as apartment, town center is apartments. So um, I agree, maybe it's something about how far back it's set from the road or because in this particular case, definitely it is far enough back that I don't think we're missing out on anything. It's not awkward for people walking around town looking into someone's dining room. So I, I think it fits, but that definitely we need to think about that as we move forward, so. Thanks, Gretchen. Uh, other comments from anybody? Councilor Devereaux? Um, I, I wanna echo uh, Councilor Noonan and Gabrielson's comments, especially with regard to the zoning. I, I loved your presentation. You've um, brought together a beautiful design. However, I see some difficulties with it. And um, one is the zoning. I think that one of the reasons we created this town center concept is so that we would have some retail and we'd have a vital town center. If we change the zoning, um, there's one other lot there. Who's to say that they're going to put retail downstairs? So we'll have a dentist office and that's it in that, in that center. Um, and maybe that's fine. However, I thought we were really looking at bringing in um, some businesses and creating this vital, vibrant downtown center. Um, also, we we're looking at um, having, having some businesses, having some commercial income. So we'll have no tax revenue from any retail businesses or we'll get, and we'll get 35% um, tax revenue for 30 years. So that is a cost to the town, even though, um, because we're actually reducing what we would be bringing in. Um, however, there's a trade-off to everything. I agree with that. One of my other problems is the diversity. Um, we're looking at 55 and over. There's not gonna be a whole lot of um, single parents that are 55 um, with a two-year-old, maybe, but not, not too many. So we're really looking at um, older couples, which our town is full of um, that demographic, which is fabulous. But it'd be great with our decreasing um, school enrollment to have some um, two bedroom units, some family friendly units, especially since we're looking at right across the street from the school. So that's, um, one of the difficulties I see. And then the big difficulty is um, parking. And we talked about this and I talked with um, Mr. Zanton and his associates about this. We had problems with parking when um, Dr. Jacobson brought the project to us. The um, town hall had to give up certain spaces for parking for um, just to create the um, the complex that Mr. Jacobson, Dr. Jacobson was putting together. So now we're talking about, um, I believe there's only, what was it, 30, 37, 34 spots? 34. 34. 34. And we're going to have 49 units. Of those 49, I'm guessing at least half are gonna have two people. So we're talking about giving up spaces at town center, where is everyone going to park? And we were assured by Dr. Jacobson that the, um, in the evenings, it wouldn't be a problem. We have town meetings, we're voting, we have people in town hall. It wouldn't be a problem because in the evenings, his dental office is closed. Um, however, we're gonna have a lot of people parking in town center. I, I would really like to see, um, their plans address this because um, that's gonna put a heavy burden on town center. You're gonna have friends visiting, you're gonna have families visiting. Uh, where, where's everyone gonna park? And we already have problems in the mornings 
with all of the traffic and all the kids. Town center is, we've been talking for years about, uh, you know, do we put in a light? Do we put in a roundabout? This is going to compound that. Um, so I'd really like to see parking talked about and um, discussed. Otherwise, um, I, um, you know, I think it's a good, it's a really good start. It's, but the zoning issue and parking are both two issues that I think we really need to look at. Valerie, I just want to respond to a couple of things you mentioned. The, the first being, I heard you mention 55 plus, there's, there's no age restriction or designation uh, of, of the development. So um, while I think the developers talked about this may be appealing to a certain demographic, it's not specifically designated as such like some other um, developments are, so. Um, oh, okay, so when, when they met with me, they told me it was going to be 55 and older that they had talked to Maureen and that was the decision. Is, has that changed, um, Nathan? So, um, Chair Garvin, can I respond to that? Go ahead, yeah. Yep. Um, so, um, and I apologize, we, we, um, the situation is that the purchase and sale agreement we have with Dr. Jacobson um, says that the, the development will be 55 and over. Um, oh, okay. But but we are we are discussing it with Dr. Jacobson, and, and um, we our goal is to is to is hopefully to get to a place where it's not it's not 50, it's for all ages. And I think you know we we've had some discussions with him, and I think he's he seems to be favorably can you know uh, favorable towards that. And he but he has not made a final decision on it. So we're working on that issue. Um, and um, Jamie, when we met with you, we actually had forgotten, frankly, that it, that, that provision was in the purchase and sale agreement. And, and so the first okay. couple of meetings we had with individual counselors, we, we had forgotten that and then we realized it. And so the latter meetings we had with counselors, we told them that it was, it was currently restricted, but we were working to try to get that restriction taken off. Um, so that's where we stand. Understood. At. My... Um, my, go ahead. Can I go? Thanks, Jamie. Um, my other concern with that is that um, the strain on our um, fire rescue, we were already having um, a strain on our EMT, our fire. And if we put in 49 units and everyone is 55 and over, that's going to be another strain um, on, on that. So I think that's something we have to take in consideration, especially since we won't be receiving any tax benefit um, to help offset that. So um, that's something we have to consider. Um, Valerie, just the other thing I wanted to either clarify or just offer different point of view on, I guess. Um, you had mentioned in regard to commercial assessment, um, the town you know, potentially forgoing or not re not realizing or recognizing its full revenue potential. I, I just want to be clear that other than the the assessed value of commercial real estate, there whether there's a business in a property or or not, the town doesn't benefit in any other way from a from a tax or or revenue standpoint. It's it's basically just taxing the asset, taxing the revenue, uh, uh, taxing the uh, real estate, it, it's not like there's a local sales tax or um, local income tax or anything like that. So um, frankly, I, just in, in my opinion on that specific point, the assessed value of something like this would be ultimately much greater than say, even a one or two story building that had, you know, coffee shop on the first floor and maybe an office above or something like that. I, I think the total assessed value of this is going to be long term much much greater than than anything that had commercial exposure in it but um that's just my point of view and then with the 65 35 split, the last point is, is that the town the town will still recognize over the course of that tiff period if it goes forward slightly more than a third of the taxable revenue um just not the not the full taxable revenue so it's it's not nothing and with with nothing built there today it is zero so I think that's part part of what we're going to have to weigh in, in evaluating this is 
um, you know, like many things, it'll be one in the hand versus two in the bush of, of unknown of what would go in there instead of something like this. Um, Council Boucher, did you have anything you had, wanted to add or? or? Oh, and I know this is a very specific property to help solve the solution of probably a very specific audience, but my hope in an ideal state would be that people who live in Cape Elizabeth today could downsize to bring in families or to rent their properties to, to other people who are of need in Cape Elizabeth. And, and you can say in the market right now, maybe that's not realistic. Maybe they are selling to out-of-staters, um, whatever might happen, but you know, and this, uh, this gives an opportunity for that to even happen. And that opportunity doesn't exist today in the way our mar market is with the housing shares that we have. Thanks, Nicole. Um, does anybody else have any comment? I, I just wanted to add a couple of things, but um, does anybody else have any comment? Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty enthusiastic about this as well. Um, I think um, the way I look at this is very big picture, um, and I appreciate very much the comments that were made by a number of the folks from the public. Um, I think uh, my view on things like this is always to take a, a pretty pragmatic approach and that we can't solve all of the world's ills with one single development. Um, but as part of a larger picture and a larger, larger planning process, um, you know, things like this do become interconnected with other opportunity. Um, I think uh, those of you who have been on the council, you know, with me for a number of years now, um, you know, have heard me in multiple different meetings and multiple different contexts talk about conversations I've had with realtors about the number of folks that have raised their families here and are looking to stay in town um, and don't have the type of places that they can stay and downsize to. And I think that the trickle down and domino effect that this has the potential to have in terms of opening up some of those properties um, and creating some of the turnover that frankly, Cape Elizabeth has been you know, underperforming on real estate turnover over the last number of years. And there's a number of, you know, anecdotally you'll hear from realtors that there's a number of people and customers that they have that would love to move to town and just, you know, there isn't the inventory of properties opening up. And so I think this is something that could um, create a little bit of relief in that capacity. Um, that's very intriguing to me. Um, I do, I, I appreciate the cl clarification, Nathan, about, about the age restriction. I, my, my fervent hope would be that you could work that out um, as part of the purchase and sale, because I think it is also important to provide, even if it's uh, um, not an overwhelming, um, you know, likelihood of, uh, of your tenants, that um, you know, there is opportunity for you know, people that fall outside of that demographic. Maybe it's somebody who's just starting off um, and wants to live in Cape or works in Cape and wants to live where they work, et cetera. Um, and uh, so it, not having that age restriction would be ideal from my perspective, but um, I'll just leave that at that. Um, the other thing just that I would point out about the commercial um, impact, um, again, I think, I think this is just one of those examples where you really have to, you know, weigh the pros and cons of, well, is this trade-off of, of, you know, making an exception to what is our otherwise standard zoning uh, for this area of town? Is, is the public benefit of this and is, is the value of this particular development worth, um, you know, sacrificing that otherwise standard zoning criteria? Um, you know, for me, I think it is. I think somebody else described, you know, th there, there aren't many other, um, you know, opportunities like this one, I don't think um, that really have the chance to be kind of transformational in our um, desire to achieve our objective of, of adding some more affordable housing in town. So um, to me, that I think is a worthwhile trade-off, but I fully recognize that it's, you know, it's a compromise that needs to be made um, if that's the way we go. What I would say though, just to finish that point is that there are a number of other commercial real estate locations within the town center currently that are vacant or have had frequent turnover in the last few years. And that something like this could become the anchor um, to help stabilize some of that activity. Um, so if you think about the former Key Bank um, location on the corner of um, you know, Shore Road and 77, some of the turnover that's happened in the Pond Cove Plaza, um, some of the turnover that's happened um, uh, you know, elsewhere in, in the sort of Four Corners area there, um, this to me would seem like it has the potential to, to kind of stabilize some of that commercial activity and, and potentially, um, you know, spur some new, some new opportunities there as well. So 
So um, that's my thoughts on it. Um, unless anybody else has any comments they want to bring up at this time, I, I, I think based on the comments that have been made on the council uh, by the council, Nathan, you've probably gotten some of that um, you know wind direction that you were looking for. Yes, we have. Um, I'm I'm enthusiastic about you know seeing how this progresses. Um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, hopefully we can uh, keep working towards uh, you know seeing seeing this move in a positive direction. So, thank you, uh, I, Matt. I, you want to? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could just I'll ask go to, one I'll question. Go to Matt first, Nate. Sure. Uh, ju just yeah. a quick question, uh, just for uh, looking at scheduling. Would uh, would the council be comfortable with us? putting an item on uh, next week's council agenda to move perhaps uh, the, like the uh, move to the planning board for recommendations on changes to the ordinance to meet the requests uh, uh, for this project. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. And also I would, um, whether we need to take action on it at the council meeting or not, just um, uh, ask that you and, and Maureen, um, you know, any of the, the beginning legwork that you can do to uh, gather the information and, and start the ball rolling on what would be needed from a council perspective on the TIF, um, that would be helpful for us to understand as well, so. Yes, sir, we can take care of it. We'll, we'll start moving, moving forward. Uh, I saw a lot of nodding heads, so we'll take that as a, uh, see that on next week's agenda. And Nathan, I'm sorry, did you wanna make a final? Yeah, just very, um, very briefly, because I know yeah. you're, I know you're, you're pressed for time. Just in response to Councillor Gabrielson's and Councillor Noonan and Councillor Devereaux's um, concern about the loss of, of potential additional commercial space on first floors in the down in the town center, um, I believe that the way that the planning staff and the planning board would would structure a zoning amendment to give us what we need would not be to open the door for everyone to remove commercial space from their first floor. It would be written in such a way that if you were providing a substantial amount of affordable housing, for example, um, it would open the door for that. So it would it would it, it's it would be written in a pretty narrow fashion, um, so that you wouldn't see that going away um, for say the person who's who's developing the lot number one in um, in Ocean Ocean House Commons or in or other um, lots that are that are situated in a, in a place that where commercially would be important because it's close to the road and close to other commercial activity. So I just wanted to make that point in response to their concerns. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you for your time tonight and for the presentation. Uh, thank, thank you, you for, for your interest time. in, in yep, yeah, thank you for your interest in, in um, this project. And we'll look forward to keeping tabs on how things move forward, so. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah, you as well. And thank you for all the public that um, offered comment. Um, uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, so the next item I'm going to go to is item number two, which is ordinance committee recommendation relating to traffic ordinance parking amendments to Kettle Cove at Crescent Beach and Seaview Avenue, Glen Avenue. Um, so there's been um, just by way of background, um, referral by the town council to the ordinance committee um, back in September um, to review chapter 13 of traffic regulations, consider amending those, that ordinance to allow for non-commercial watercraft launching at the boat launch near the entrance to Kettle Cove and at the end of Crescent Beach as an allowed use. And then separately, um, we had a uh, workshop and referral to the ordinance committee around parking recommendations to try and alleviate some of the usage and intensity uh, in the Cliff House Beach area. Um, so what I'm gonna do, even though this is a single agenda item for the interest of public comment, um, I'm going to ask if anybody um, would like to comment on um, the changes and amendments related to the Kettle Cove and Crescent, Kettle Cove at Crescent Beach uh, amendments first. And if you do want to comment, you can use the raise hand function in the meeting. That was what I figured would be the case. So the next one is I'll ask if there's, oh, go ahead, Jeremy. You have one for Kettle Cove, it looks like. Oh, oh, 
Corey, cool. You jumped in there right before I, I had to tap out of there. So Corey, uh, Matt will open up your mic and um, if you could just give us your address uh, before your comments, please go ahead. Hi, this is Corey Cool. It's 13 Algonquin Road. Um, I guess my comment is I'm a little concerned. Um, just want to make sure I'm not losing my access to launch my boat at Crescent Beach. And I, I'm not 100% sure what's going on, but it, it just, I want to make sure I do not lose that access because it's the only boat launch we have in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Yep. So, uh, Go ahead, um, Matt or Maureen, did you want to maybe answer with a quick explanation summary of the um, amendment and the change? Matt, do you want to go, go ahead, Maureen? My, go, go my main Maureen. question is if you launch your boat with using a trailer, um, you will still be able to do that. Yep. So this is, this is just about what can be parked, right? Right, but if if this the way the draft is written, if you are using the launch to, um, you know, something that's small enough that it doesn't need a trailer, then you wouldn't you wouldn't be using this anymore. Right. So, Corey, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. So then you can still park the trailer on the beach. Correct. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that clarification. Yeah, no, the, the objective of the council is to provide as much access as possible, not remove access. So, um, but we're just trying to also manage traffic and parking concerns. So this isn't about um, removing or restricting access um, for boats or anything. It's just a matter of um, trying, to, trying to manage the parking intensity. Um, okay, does anybody else have a comment on um, on the Kettle Cove portion? Seeing none, is there uh, anybody from the public that wishes to speak about the um, Cliff House Beach area recommendations? Tom McCulka, you're first. If you could just give your address before your comments, that'd be great. Your mic's open. Uh, Tom Akolka for Mountain View Road uh, for the last 19 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had shared a, uh, a five or six slide presentation with Matt. Um, if, uh, if that's okay that we run through that to give the council some background on the, on the topic. Matt, I can either present or you can present. Let's hopefully just start. You, yeah, we got that screen. Is that, is that, everybody can see that okay? Awesome, yep. thank you. That works. Let me give a little background and then I'll, Matt, I'll give you a, a, a signal on when to move forward. Thank um, thanks everybody for this time. Um, this should only take, you know, seven or eight minutes to get through, maybe a little longer. Uh, so this, um, this neighborhood uh, has partnered with the town a few times in the past two decades, uh, going back to the Patriots Day storm when the, when the stairs were destroyed. And then more recently with a dog ordinance uh, that to ensure that dog lovers and those that don't love dogs uh, can both enjoy the beach at, at the end of Cliff House Beach. Uh, this, the, the dog ordinance worked quite well. Uh, we we uh, worked together with the town to come up with uh, some new rules for uh, when dogs could enjoy the beach and when people can enjoy the beach without dogs and uh, really addressed the, the issue we we're having down there and it's, and it's settled in quite well over the last two years. This, this new collaboration is to address traffic and parking and safety concerns from uh, overuse that have been building for the last few years, um, specifically after Cliff House Beach got noticed on social media, and then even more, more um, dramatically uh, due to COVID. There were a lot of people looking for beaches, but um, the pressure that we saw this summer was the result of a trend that we've been seeing in the neighborhood for a few years. Uh, it just spiked um, with COVID uh, dramatically. So uh, Matt, if we go to the next page, please. So we, uh, with in collaboration with Maureen and the town, um, uh, put a survey out. So we sent a survey to 496 addresses around the neighborhood. We got 133 responses, which is a, quite a good response rate for this type of a survey. 
uh, from, you can see a pretty good cross section of streets, those right near Cliff House Beach and those within walking or biking or even driving distance. Uh, circle with, with no number next to it uh, is only one respondent. Uh, you'll see in the, in, the, in the coming slides, there were four questions asking about kind of what the neighborhood experience has been over the last year or so. And then four questions about potential ideas on how to address the experience in the neighborhood. And we also collected about 80 pages of verbatim comments, which take about an hour, hour and a half to read through. If you haven't gone through those yourselves and you're interested, there's a lot of good feedback and thoughtfulness in there, um, but uh, that contributes to, to the, the rest of the survey that you're going to see here. Uh, let's move to the next slide, Matt. So this is um, the four questions that we ask about neighborhood impact. And you can see, I'll read through these briefly, but um, you know, question number two was the increase in the number of people in vehicle traffic at Cliff House Beach has changed the character of our neighborhood. 82% uh, agreed or strongly agreed with this comment. Uh, my family avoids going to Cliff House Beach at certain times because of the number of people in vehicles. 76% uh, agreed or strongly agreed. Uh, the number of people in vehicles has steadily increased over the past five years and not just COVID in 2020 and 83% agreed with that. And then lastly, uh, Cliff House Beach is identified as a small neighborhood park uh, that primarily serves the neighborhood and there's been an increasing number of people in vehicles that uh, aren't from Cape or the surrounding neighborhoods. And that was a you know, 91%. So you can see that uh, there was a strong uh, agreement from the, from the respondents that there really has been a change. We're starting to see a change in the character of the neighborhood and that those of us who had been using this for decades are starting to avoid it. Uh, because of how uh, crowded it's become and overused. And then just the parking and the amount of uh, churn in the vehicles up and down these streets has, has really changed quite a bit. Next slide, Matt. So we asked four questions. Uh, you know, these were questions that we put out a while back. And uh, the, the one was uh, an idea around uh, from May 1st to September 30th, which mimics the dog rules as well. That parking on Seaview and Glen Ave's would be restricted to Kate residents only with uh, something like displaying a transfer sticker uh, or some other mechanism of showing you're from Cape. 82% um, agreed or strongly agreed with that. We pitched an idea of uh, a beach parking zone for non-residents out on Shore Road. Um, that, was, that was shot down for good reasons. Um, just starting to stack up cars on shore is also another safety issue. And also signage advertising that there's parking for a beach that you might not know about might just make the problem worse. So uh, we decided that was not a good idea. We didn't recommend that to the, to the ordinance committee. Uh, talked about parking spots near the beach for vehicle churn. And uh, again, the feedback was, was pretty clear that that just would also make the churn worse. Uh, to have cars in and out, in and out. Um, if you're going to park and walk to the beach, then you should be able to carry down what you're going to the beach with and not need to, to, um, to go down and unload a car. So uh, not recommending that as an idea. And then lastly, um, adding space for a bike corral. Uh, you'll see in one of the pictures, a lot of people enjoy bringing their bikes there, but there's no place to put them and they just get strewn all over the, over the lawn down there. Uh, so next slide, Matt. So for a summary, um, you know, this, the town has designated Cliff House Beach as primarily a neighborhood resource um, due to its size, location, lack of facilities. For those of you who know the beach, um, at high tide, it's all rock. Uh, at low tide, when the sand has come in, there is sand for a period of time, but it's not a sand beach all the time. And so there's, the space changes dramatically on where you can sit on this beach. Um, we recognize it's a public space. Um, the neighborhood's not asking for this to get any kind of a private designation. Uh, the ask isn't to exclude non-residents, but to give improved access to Cape residents and really protect the neighborhood character uh, and address the, the emergency access and the parking issues that we were seeing. Next slide, Matt. So these were the recommendations that we, that we put forward. It was, they were around um, no, some no parking areas around Seaview and Glen, um, restricting uh, parking uh, in some areas to Cape Elizabeth residents only, and the bike racks, um, investigating what other neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth have done or other communities, and a follow-on workshop, which we're doing today. Uh, the language that we saw put forward in the town council, um, the, the last town council was held uh, we're in support of uh, the, the types of decisions that were made based on this survey 
Uh, we think it's, it's a good decision to move forward with and see how it works. Um, there, there will always be second and third order consequences of the decisions we make, but we can always address those after the fact. Uh, we think that uh, um, trying out the recommendation that was presented to the town council uh, were in support of in, in the neighborhood. So thanks for your time and I hope this background was helpful. Thanks, Tom, and I appreciate, again, all the work you and um, your neighbors have done to gather the information and, and help to inform the Ordinance Committee and the full council tonight on, uh, on the situation over there, so appreciate it. Um, are there other members of the public that want to make any comment on this specific portion of the agenda item? Okay. Um, is there any discussion from anybody on the council who wants to start off? You did just get one hand, Jamie. Oh, it keeps happening every time I go to close it out. Thank you, though. Appreciate it. Tom Myers. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, once Matt opens up your mic, uh, if you wouldn't mind just adding your address for us. And go ahead. We can hear you. Thank you, uh, uh, Jamie. I'm Tom Myers. I'm at 4 I don't know if we'll have other opportunities to participate in the discussion uh, as we go through. We all were happy to, as you know, there's probably a couple of us here that are happy to answer questions. Tom, can I? Yes. Tom, can I interrupt you? You're just, you're just a little muffled. Hey, have I don't know if you're a little bit better. Let me see. I'll try my, uh, I'll use my outdoor voice. That's, that's much better. Okay. I'll use my big boy outdoor voice. Um, <laughs> Thank you. We're, um, I don't know if you will have an opportunity to chat um, or ask or answer questions that the council or other councilors might have during the discussion. If that's the case, we'll just um, let you go at it. And if something pops up, we'll jump in if that's okay. Rather than taking more time, I, it, it, you know, I, I know we've um, had a great opportunity and Tom gives a great presentation on um, just the background, but I know many of the counselors are new and some of them have not been participating in this in the past. So if there's something that crops up, we're happy to answer any questions. We, we felt really good about the collaboration we've had with both the town and the ordinance committee and the conservation committee, as well as some of the uh, counselors. So um, we're here to answer anything you might have. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Again, uh, anybody else want to Weigh in from the public before we engage in discussion amongst the counselor. Okay. Um, any counselors have any thoughts out of the gate here? Go ahead, Councilor Noonan. Thanks. Um, mine are around the Crescent Beach issue, so I don't know if it's okay place to start. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering if anyone can fill me in on why this uh, new definition of watercraft is around the trailer, because um, I guess I have a couple questions about that. Is it, I don't know if it's about the size or if it really is that there's literally nowhere else for people who have a trailer to launch their boat. Because I, 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 I think um, Maureen had said something about bigger uh, vessels that couldn't be launched from a car, but a lot of people do tow their kayaks on a trailer or a dinghy or um, things like that. So I don't know if the trailer is about literally the size of the boat, in which case, I don't know if we would wanna call a watercraft like a hauled boat instead. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, Jeremy seems yep. to so, understand. What um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm gonna ask if yep. either Penny or Maureen wanna to speak to that um, specifically, uh, just from, uh, you know, for the background purposes from, from what the discussion yeah. was at the ordinance committee level, so. Um, Andy, do you want me to dive in or are you going to take care of this? You can take it. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to defer to Matt as well, but my understanding is that the reason, the main reason that uh, this amendment was sent from the council to the ordinance committee is because of an overuse of the launch area by people who really did not need to use it and that there was even an abuse of people who uh, were parking and launching lawn chairs rather than actual watercraft. So in an effort to try to tighten up and, and, and when the police chief was called to try to deal with 
those uh, issues, the, they discovered that the ordinance really didn't give the police department the authority to deal with what were um, probably an abuse of the intent of being able to use that launch area. So as part of the ordinance committee's work, um, a definition of watercraft was created to really kind of bring the launch area back to its original intended use, which was for people who had boats that needed to be launched and they landed pretty quickly on the issue of using a trailer. And then um, were also pretty clear that they did not want people who had things like kayaks to be able to drive down onto the beach and park when a kayak can basically be carried. Um, it doesn't mean you can't put your kayak there, but you're not going to be parking your vehicle there when you're using your kayak. So I think that was uh, why we ended up where we am, where we are, and I, I'm going to defer to others if they want to fill that in anymore. Thanks, Maureen. Penny, yeah. was there anything you wanted to add? Gretchen, does that answer your question? It does. And I'll just follow up with that um, by saying, I guess my concern is that you can technically tow almost anything on a trailer like kayaks. Um, so someone who tows a kayak on a trailer could bring their kayaks down there, but someone who puts their kayaks on top of their car cannot. Um, I also have a concern about the moorings that are there because I know I have witnessed and I do have a friend that does this. Um, who accesses his mooring by driving his paddleboard down and then launching the paddleboard and taking it out to the mooring. I also know that some people put dinghies in the back of a pickup truck. Um, so I, I also just want to express a concern that maybe people may have trouble accessing their moorings um, that are there. So I don't know if anyone else. Jeremy, you were waiting patiently. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a good point, Gretchen. I guess. Um, the other, th the other objective that's achieved by limiting the parking to trailer vehicles is that it, it, it is a visible demonstration for enforcement purposes that a boat has been launched, even if the person who launched is not there. Um, and so I, I think that's part of the rationale. I, I, I do hear you on going down from a paddleboard or, or from a dinghy. I guess what I would say is if you have the permit, to do that, you could still launch those vehicles here. You, you'd just be needing to look for parking for that vehicle while you are out at your boat elsewhere. And there is other, you know, nearby parking there. I, you know, I, I've launched kayaks from Kettle Cove parking before without going down onto the beach. It's, it's a, a feasible thing to do. Jamie? Penny? Um, and Maureen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. I believe on the, the subsequent page, the, a motor vehicle may be parked by a commercially licensed fisherman. So therefore your example of a dinghy in the back of a pickup truck, uh, they can take it out of the back of their pickup truck. They, have, uh, they can take their motor vehicles down in order to um, conduct their business. For commercial. For commercial. For commercial. But I don't, the, the moorings that are um, right off of Crescent as opposed to off of Kettle Cove, I, are, those aren't all commercial, are they? I think there's, anyone can get one of those moorings, I think. So, uh, okay. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Somebody else would have to answer that. Is, uh, if, if I may. Uh, Go ahead, Matt. Yes, there are uh, there are uh, non-commercial folks using the moorings. Uh, you know, they just have to get their permission from the harbor master and and get the permit for that. So the uh, uh, but I think uh, yeah, part of the problem we ran into last summer was the abuse that was taking place, where people would come and they would tell uh, the PD when they were getting their day permit that they were going there for a launch and and they had a boogie board or they had something along those lines, something that could be easily carried. And, uh, you know, it was, a, you know, this year was, uh, had its rare, had its fair share of anomalies, uh, leave it at that. But, uh, and I know the park as well has ch somewhat changed its stance as far as uh, uh, they would like to have people bring their paddle boards and launch at the, uh, at the Crescent Beach State Park, or they've made it more accessible for kayaks. They, they prefer that more than, 
uh, than having folks come on the other side. So uh, I know uh, that was part of what they had expressed a desire for and that they're willing to work. And then uh, the other item is uh, we do have in the summertime, we used to have a kayak camp uh, run through uh, community services. And by having this, I mean, they would stack them up on the, you know, in their trailer. And they, I mean, it is trailered, so they do have multiple kayaks on there. This would be, uh, would legitimize that. And, you know, hopefully, you know, and on the 10th, when we look at the launch uh, proposal that we have as well, uh, it'll make it better for the, for the surrounding neighbors as well and not having people trying to launch kayaks there. We actually asked them to try to do it at the, at the other beach facilities as well, because it was not conducive to good traffic flow and it wasn't good, but yeah, it's, it's, there's not a lot of great answers to it, but this seems to be more in line with the, uh, the intent of what, uh, what was originally desired. Just to point out that the since we're talking Kettle Cove. Yeah, um, ahead, so I wanted to point out that the definition of watercraft in the ordinance change does say uh, excludes flotation devices such as, but not limited to paddleboard, surfboard, inflatables, pool toys. So it, it is specified there that that kind of doesn't count to come with your paddleboard. I agree, except the Coast Guard defines a paddleboard as a vessel not a flotation device. So, and I'm sure kayaks are the same. So, um, yeah, I, I understand that. So my, the final thing I'll say is I, I guess my feeling would be, it might be more specific to say to launch a hauled boat that is propelled by a motor or by wind or something like that. But I understand the idea that you need the trailer to show like you know, whoever is doing the enforcement, that someone has actually launched a be a, a vessel. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of neither one quite does everything for us, I think. But other comments? I do. I have a um, I have a comment, and and Maureen, maybe you can help me with this one. Um, it's on the very last page, the beach access restrictions. Um, no person shall operate motor vehicle on Crescent Beach except for the express purpose of launching a watercraft. And we, um, there was a question from a fisherman. He wanted to make sure that his ability to uh, take traps, et cetera, down to the beach and off uh, his boat was uh, possible. Is This isn't precluding him from doing anything such as that, correct? I, I think that those activities come under commercial fishing. Yep, that's what I said. That's exactly the answer I gave him. Good, let's go with that. Okay, good, we're consistent, I love it. Any other comments on, we'll stick with Crescent Beach for the moment. Sorry, right. Jamie, I just wanted to point out um, yeah. under watercraft that flotation has a spelling error that's very minor, but. Okay. Sorry, it's under the, the, yeah, do you see it? Under the definition of watercraft yeah. where it says flotation devices, yeah. We, we can delete the extra A. <laughs> Thank you for that. Any other comments on uh, Crescent Beach Kettle Cove? So next up on this will be a uh, referral to um, planning board, correct? Because uh, with the amendment, ordinance amendment? Yes, for, yes, that would be correct. Yeah, we'll And then public that. hearing? Yep. Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, Matt? Yeah. This is not an amendment to the zoning ordinance. Right. We go to public okay. hearing, don't we? So this, this goes right back to the council. The planning board is now. Oh, okay. Them. So yeah. we, but we still do need to have a public hearing. Yep, we, right. can, we can get it on uh, next week's agenda to have it referred to a public hearing for. Uh, Great. For March. For March, for March 1st. Okay. March Great. 8th. 
So let's move to, if there's no other thoughts on um, Crescent Beach Kettle Cove, is there any discussion about the um, recommendations for the Cliff House Beach area? Um, I, I, I'll actually start off because um, back when I was still on the ordinance committee, I think I think I was probably one of the larger proponents of doing the no parking um, as is described here. Um, and for me, it is very similar to the no parking one side of the street that's just a little further down the road um, towards Fort Williams on uh, Cottage Lane and uh, surf road, um, which is um, in proximity to Casino Beach. So um, very similar uh, sort of uh, horseshoe uh, uh, kind of kind of road contour, narrow roads, um, a lot of the same issues relative to vehicular um, access and egress and uh, getting emergency vehicles through and things like that. And so uh, to me, it seems like a, a very um, good good analog to the problem that I think was largely solved um, in that area um, by instituting a, a pretty similar solution here. So other folks thoughts? I wasn't particularly interested in things, uh, particularly with a, with a public space while, while understanding the primary use being a, a community and neighborhood beach, hopefully benefiting Cape Elizabeth residents the most. I, I wasn't particularly interested in anything that was having to demonstrate residency as a means of, of parking. Um, uh, other than Fort Williams, we don't really have that um, as, as um, a delineation um, between users. And um, I agree with the points that were made earlier about not looking to, to move the traffic elsewhere, move the parking and problems elsewhere. So I think just by, by restricting the parking altogether, I think it'll go a long way. Also in the image that you see on page three of the, the memo attachment, um, I think a number of the places where it's shown to be changed to no parking, it, it's not like there's necessarily a ton of space technical spaces that exist there to be removing anyway, and particularly um, up around Shore Road when you come in from Seaview. Um, I think that with, with the new house construction that just went up there, I think there's, with, that house has a pretty wide driveway. So I think, I think there's only about um, two, maybe three vehicles that could actually park at least in that stretch anyway. So even just opening that up, I think we'll, we'll um, you know, relieve a, a tremendous amount of congestion there. And if, if people see that there's no parking there, um, right off the bat, when they turn off of Shore Road, um, hopefully it'll encourage behavior change the rest of the way too, so. Jeremy? Yeah, um, thank you. I, I, I just, I wanna start off by saying, I, I came into this discussion in ordinance committee kind of sharing your position uh, about having some concerns of of making this uh, resident only parking um, and you know opening up that that precedent more so than we already have with Fort Williams. Um, I think what brought me around on that um, in discussion with the residents was their description of um, how a, a lot of the the behavior that they're seeing from folks who you know appear to be uh, coming to other nearby beaches and then not finding parking there and then just circling the neighborhood um, in a way that makes, you know, it looks like maybe, you know, they got to, they got to um, South Portland and, and were going down to the beach and the parking lot was full. So they pulled out their cell phone and looked for the next icon that had a beach on it on Google Maps and didn't even necessarily care that they were going to this beach. It was just the next nearby place. Um, so I think that um, that's really sort of the, the, cruising problem, if you will, that that feature was designed to address. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave that at that. Um, I, I, do, I do see there's a little bit of creep that we might open up with that in terms of other areas of town where that also experience high use from residents and non-residents. Um, 
and um, so I, I think it's important to flag that as something that's a little bit different from what we've done elsewhere. I just want to be, I, I, I don't know if maybe I was misheard or misunderstood. I, so that's the one part that I don't agree with still. So I, I'm in favor of all the other changes. I, I, I don't agree with that though. So go ahead, Penny. Um, I just want to add that um, one of the reasons that I kind of got there as well relative to the um, uh, permitted or residents only is I keep thinking about this, this balance that we need to strike or we need to consider. Um, and that's that balance of um, neighbor, neighborhood and, um, uh, and I'm gonna call it tourism. There's a balance we constantly need to strike. And so what is that criteria that we're going to use in order to, to balance and to balance the decision? Um, and, and I know it's going to come up in, in other, other parts of town, but um, I, I really heard what the people who live in that neighborhood are saying. Um, I respect what they're saying and um, I, personally would not want that pressure in my neighborhood. Um, and, um, and so I move toward that direction of let's have it permitted only for a period of time, align it with the same as the, the uh, dogs on the beaches. Um, and, um, and I think that that will help take some of the pressure off uh, with the traffic and parking in that neighborhood. So I weighed neighborhood. Other comments? Councilor Deborah? Um, I have to say, I, I agree with Councilor Jordan. I, I think that um, the neighborhood has been so impacted with cars and people and it's going to make a big difference by having it, um, the parking stickers. I, I think that'll make a big difference. I, I really love the idea of the bike racks too. I think that's going to help a lot. And there are, that way people can ride their bikes in from other areas. It's a fabulous idea. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that this is going to make a big difference in the neighborhood and um, ease some of that, uh, some of those parking problems over there. Other comments? All right. Um, well, we'll like the Kettle Cove amendments, move this on uh to a planned public hearing for our march meeting um we can vote on on that um next week and um i applaud the ordinance committee for the work on on trying to come up with a solution here and we'll see what happens all right thank you for those that offered uh their comment um so our, our last agenda there's a hand raised Oh, just went down. Never mind. There was a hand raised from somebody with the name Cams. If, if you wanted to make a comment, I'd be happy to hear from you. I don't know. I'm assuming it was on the topic that we just left off of, but go ahead. When Matt opens your mic, if you could just give us your name and address, please go ahead. Yes. Hi, um, Christopher Campbell, 598 Shore Road. Um, just quickly, I know it's been a long night. I just want to thank the council for facilitating the discussion about these new uh, restrictions. And, and I also want to welcome the new members and thank them for giving their time and, and energy to the town. Um, I was intimately involved with developing the dog survey and the, the current survey that we uh, were talking about, and which included, of course, really great collaboration with neighbors and town committees and staff members over several years. And I just quickly want to say a few things about the current survey, which 
which includes you know 80 pages of comments. And I, and I encourage you to read it if you haven't done so. But I just want to quickly highlight a few things uh, that I think are very clear. And you know, the first is that you know the neighborhood is very passionate about this this very small cove, and it's been a, a special gathering place for residents and their families for decades. However, however, uh, for the last you know five years or so, uh, many have become disenfranchised from a place that is designated by the town as as a primary for the the benefit of the neighborhood, and and they're really looking to the town in overwhelming numbers to implement policies to restore safety and balance and the experience of visiting the beach. Uh, so I think this ordinance is a great step in that direction and I urge you to approve it. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, with no other comment, uh, we'll move on to our final agenda item, uh, which is uh, continued discussion of our 2021 council goals. Um, is there anybody that's joined the meeting tonight that wishes to um, offer any comment about our goals? The draft of our goals. John Volts again. John, when uh, Matt opens your mic up again. Yes, Go hi, right uh, John Volts, 33 Phillip Road. And I noticed, in the, in the, yeah, <laughs> it hasn't changed. Um, Go ahead, John. I, I, I noticed as you present the town goals, you note the one town concept. And I was just going to do inquire whether the one town concept arrangement between the town and the school has yet been reduced to writing. And if it has not, I would encourage you to make that part of your goals so that everyone knows how it's supposed to operate. As, um, as my someone told me once, when you have a partnership agreement in a law practice, you take the partnership agreement and you sign it and you put it in the bottom desk drawer and you close it. Um, and it's the most important piece of paper that you have, but you hope you never open that drawer, but you don't not write it. <laughs> So um, as part of your goals, I would encourage you to consider uh, reducing what the arrangement is to writing, put it in a drawer, and hopefully we never have to refer to it again. But um, right now, as, as last I know, it was not reduced to writing. So no one knows how it exactly operates, who can controls what and who can do what. Thanks, John. Are there uh, any other members of the public that would like to offer comment on the draft of the goals? Seeing none, um, Council Boucher, do you wanna sort of reset the table for us here on what you've um, put together? And I, again, wanna thank you for all your effort um, uh, continued effort on uh, on what we're looking at here. So, sure. Um, so at our last meeting, we kind of aligned on what those overall arcing pillars would be. We had a lot of ideas in our virtual sticky notes, and you know, got feedback from counselors and moved it all around. And I think had some great feedback and um, really just took the document from being a draft, I think being a solid thing that we can take a look at tonight. The major change I think would be that making all of the kind of goals and objectives underneath the strategic pillar. So there's like infrastructure, what are the things we're doing under infrastructure, um, education and continuous learning, what are we doing under that? And so that was the biggest change of how it goes. And I think from here, um, we can have discussion and alignment and hopefully vote next week. Great. Um, I, I definitely think that just for ease of understanding and, and sort of a connective thread that that change that's represented from the pillars on slide three to then how it breaks into detail on slides four through six. Um, is certainly helpful just for a common understanding of, of aligning those things. So I know that we did have some back and forth discussion on that at our last workshop 
um, you know, folks that, um, you know, had, I think, good, good, but varied opinions on that. And I, I think this does, I think, add a level of clarity and simplicity um, that makes it easier for folks to understand. So I, I'm, I'm happy to see that personally. <laughs> um, do um, other counselors want to weigh in with thoughts or um, reaction, comments? Penny, fire your hand right up. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, number one, this is like awesome. I, I think it's a fabulous document. Um, and um, I, as I read as I read through it today, I think it's really um, uh, comprehensive, easy to follow. I went back to a couple of things that I just kind of want to test uh, to see uh, if they're represented here and, and I just um, uh, kind of missed them um, or if they're implied. So one of them is that um, we always talk about continuing our implementation of the comprehensive plan. I see uh, several of the items underneath the um, strategic map as well as the, um, the goals and objectives as elements of the strategic plan. So do we want to say that that's implied or do we want to have an explicit statement about it? So that's, that's, one, that's one question. Um, and and then it's, um, I think that there are other items that are uh, represented in here. Um, we had in our goals before something about consider crafting a coastal access plan. I think we've got elements of that in here. So I kind of checked that off um, and um, the, uh, the whole development of affordable housing, I think we've got that represented in here. Um, complete the tax revaluation process, should that be represented in here under uh, fiscal responsibility? Um, I say yes. Um, so I don't think we, that that's gonna fully happen this year, Penny. It's not gonna Based happen this year? Yeah, based on the continued conditions with, with the public okay. health emergency. Okay, so I I'll forget so, about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then I get into, uh, this is just something that I think we do as a byproduct of what we do, and that's continue to monitor and evaluate our new seniors um, relief program. So I think that we don't need to explicitly state that. Um, and uh, then, sorry, I went through this whole thing. Um, then I got into, um, uh, we already did that, got into the um, conducting annual orientations for the uh, boards. I think those are implied in here. Um, so some of the things that as I looked at our previous goals, I just wanted to make sure we kind of mapped this in to say that, yes, they are uh, in here. Um, because I, yeah. think, I think they are. So um, thanks for your thoughts on this, Penny. I, I want to respond in, to two separate things that I'll take the latter first and then come back to the comp plan point. So on the, on the latter part, I think what you were just enumerating were a number of things that had, had lived in previous goals that really have functionally become business as usual for us, right? So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that they need to be continually listed as goals when it's just something that's standard operating procedure now, mm -hmm. right? So I, I view a goal as being something that's, you know, either net new or requires a certain amount of continuous work and effort to, to achieve or produce um, on an ongoing basis. So, if, but if, if, if something else like the senior tax, re, you know, reporting on the senior tax um, program or, um, you know, there being standard orientation and introduction for board members and, and um, you know, training and stuff like that, to, to me, that's, that's run rate stuff that I don't know that we need to enumerate. Now, if a goal here, 
was something that you know like has been discussed and we, we may get some feedback for example from the um, civil rights committee that you know maybe the entire council and staff or whomever else um, should undergo diversity uh, education and training uh, like that's a new thing that would be a goal for me that at some point would presumably become a bau you know business as usual um, kind of thing but at least for this year would be something that's net new does that kind of distinguish those two things it does and that's what i i really wanted us to all hear that out loud because yeah. When people ask, uh, geez, you didn't have anything around comprehensive plan on there. Um, it's like, whoa, that's what well, we I'm going to come to that in a minute, too. That's yeah, what I'm we going to come to that. Uh, yeah, many so, of the things like you say that were on the goals were uh, business as usual. But I think we all need to agree that that doesn't belong in here. It belongs someplace else. Yeah. So very specific to the comprehensive plan. Um, you, you, well, you know, some of you who are on the council at the time will remember the, the you know, somewhat painstaking exercise that we went through to take the comp plan and take all those recommendations and turn them into sort of an action item list. Um, and I, I, I do think it is worth basically, and, 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 you know, fairly recently, somebody kind of called me to task on, on this to say, oh, well, the comp plan is almost two years old now. And one of the things that was in there was as a, as a, near-term goal had to do with sidewalks and accessibility and all that kind of stuff and while we've had a couple of small projects well not small projects a couple of projects that have made a smallish impact against that goal you know there's some pretty major projects that at the very least have been things we've raised in discussion but you know we we haven't maybe made as much headway against um so i don't know if some of those types if we, if we need to take that list basically dust off that list and i know matt you and staff you know look at that very closely because a lot of a lot of your work planning you know is, is based right out of that and certainly some of the things that come to us you know you know visa you know v maureen and the planning board are, are you know things that came out of those recommendations and things like that but so i guess some of the more project oriented tactical implementation stuff from the comp plan I think Penny does raise a good point to make sure that we're not losing sight of that. And I don't think we want to get into bulleting all that stuff out in these goals, but maybe maybe it's part of the ongoing initiatives. It's the very first bullet in ongoing initiatives to say all of those things are laid out in the comp plan as, as being, you know, stuff that's due this year. Let's make sure we get it done, that kind of thing. Go ahead, Penny. When you talk about the, the sidewalks and things, that's why uh, when we talked about it, it accessibility and um you know walkability and all of those things in here in in the goals that we have written that nicole so beautifully crafted is represented there but i agree we need to test and see in concept if some of the uh, uh the, the bigger statements that we have actually encompass uh those uh, priorities that we have in the comp plan. I tried to do a quick yeah. check. Um, the print's too small, but anyway, it's too small. You all, you all remember my, you all remember my affection for that exercise. <laughs> so <laughs> it won't surprise you that I, I have, have not, uh, I have not made frequent returns to review that list. <laughs> but anyway. Um, Jeremy, were you going to add something or Valerie? I saw one of your hands go up, but you're both center square here. So I was just going to ask Valerie, uh, Valerie for the block. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Um, I was just going to ask, can we screen share it so that um, we can all look at it real quick? Because uh, it's such a great document that Nicole's put together here. Other people may not have seen it. And I um, I just wanted to encourage us to have, because um, we talked about fiscal responsibility and social responsibility. So um, kind of what Jamie was saying earlier, if the Civil Rights Committee comes in and says, you know, look at this, this, and this, I'd love for us to have a spot where we can put trainings, uh, whether it's diversity or anti-racism, um, things like that in here. And, um, the other thing is transportation. I, 
I'd really like to see us have something where we talk a little bit about transportation, especially if people are thinking about um, town center having 49 units of possibly 100 people down in town center. Maybe we have some sort of um, public transportation goals. I think it's certainly possible to slot under the existing um, create climate action goals. I think what page was it on? Um, yeah, and so and then on slide four under infrastructure, you could, could probably easily add another bullet there about um, developing and promoting opportunities for public and alternative transportation. Uh, vehicular alternatives. That would be great. And then the other thing that, and I don't know, we discussed it a little bit last time is I was hoping we'd have sort of a, a big goal, sort of um, Cape Elizabeth's plans to reduce their carbon footprint by a certain amount, by a certain date. I'd really love to see us have a, a big, a big goal like that. And um, we talked about maybe joining with Portland or South Portland or someone else since we're in this community. I'd really like to see some sort of goal, whether we establish our own goal or we join forces with other communities to where we say, okay, this, we're gonna look at our carbon footprint and by 2030, 2050, this is what we plan to do. I'd love to have some sort of a, a big picture goal like that. That's where in my mind when I was writing and moving everything that develop climate change goals and action plan right here is that like we need we need to have that yeah. Yeah for me for me I think I, I'm, I'm aligned with your thinking Valerie I think I think the first step up Everest on that is to have a goal that is, okay, we need to produce what our town's goal and plan to achieve that goal will be. So rather than having it be in these goals necessarily, that the immediate and achievable goal is, this is something that we need to produce. And whether that is to sign on to, um, you know, the, the plans already established by neighboring communities or something else, that, that that would be what would come out of that rather than saying at this level right now we're going to have x amount of reduction or something like we, we don't even know without i think doing some of this work that's here um what we should be setting for that benchmark to begin with so i think at this point it would be entirely arbitrary but okay, uh, like i said I'm, I'm in total agreement with the fact that it should be a goal for us to, to figure out what a meaningful objective for us to achieve would be. Absolutely. And do we okay. put a, a, t a limit, a time limit, like within this year, we want to create our climate goals. I, I think if we have an, a date, we might get to it. Um, but if we just say, yeah, we want, we want to do this, yeah. It might be nice to say within a year, within two years, something like that, that we create this climate um, change goals would give us more of an action plan. What are your thoughts? If I could jump in on Go that ahead, Jeremy. just briefly, yep. um, I, I think one way that, I mean, I think a time frame is helpful. You know, I, I look at the leadership um, on the state side around this in terms of developing the state's climate action plan where the governor really put forward some, some broad goals that she was looking to see. Um, and, you know, really the message that the folks on that climate action planning committee took was, you know, pay attention to carbon mitigation and be bold. And so I think if we can, you know, I think maybe to address Valerie's point, one thing we could do is include some language in here, you know, that, you know, we're not looking necessarily, I mean, I think climate you know, enhancing resilience and, and making sure that our infrastructure is going to be resilient to climate change is important. But if what we're really talking about here is climate goals that are forward looking and address 
you know, carbon sequestration, that's a different thing than developing a climate plan that is, you know, really looking at adaptation. And yeah, I, I think it sounds like Valerie is, is, is saying that we should be looking at the former as part of this. I think the lat, in my, in my opinion, the latter is implicit. Um, and if we want to say that that uh, we want to be forward-looking or aggressive with our climate goals, I think it's worth putting that in this document. Thanks, Jeremy. Other comments? Go ahead, Gretchen. Oh, oh thanks. I was just going to speak up. I didn't know. I know you probably can't see everyone. Um, this is a kind of a small one, but I'll just say under healthy and diverse community where we have ensure all citizens have consistent access to healthy foods. I, I don't think that's something we can fulfill. I don't think we can ensure. Um, I'm afraid I didn't have time to think about what the alternative would be, but I think it's probably something more like um, promote consistent access or I'm struggling to think what it would be, but I, we can't guarantee that everyone's going to have Full plates every night, unfortunately. Um, so I just think it's a small wording change there. I don't know if anyone else has a suggestion. I can't think of anything right now that sounds good, but. Yeah, I think it's a good point generally, whether it's this this bullet or others to make sure that the things we're signing on to are the things that we actually have the ability to fully impact, right? Uh, I'll, I'll give a different one that's totally outside, you know, we, and, and some of you have heard me in this before, you know, when we talk about the town center and we talk about developing, you know, commercial activity there, well, there's only so much that the council actually does to, to play a role in that, um, you know, absent, um, you know, having any specific sort of economic development role on staff, so, but. Um, I feel like I, I, as a placeholder for right now, promote is fine. I feel like there's a, a, a more active word there. And like you, Gretchen, I'm struggling to come, kind of come up with it here. Promote, you know, it feels like we've gone from being completely committed to, to kind of soft on it, but um, I don't know, we can, we, we can figure that out. But I, I, I think your point is well taken and, and understood by the group, but Penny, you were gonna jump in. I think, Jamie, I think there's a, um, a point that's getting lost in that um, that statement where we took the insurer away because um, it has to do with either all citizens or it's really about addressing um, uh, food insecurity in our town, which there's a problem. Yeah, so maybe, it, it, you know, w without copywriting it on the fly here, maybe it's just, you know, take meaningful actions to help address the issue of food okay, insecurity. Okay, so rather than, among rather residents. than ensure, yeah. say address. Yeah. Address food insecurity, blah, 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 whatever. Other thoughts from folks? I don't want to take us off this point prematurely, but I, I had a question. Um, yes. Under the promote agriculture in town, can someone explain what what the, the bullet point, what that create visibility is intended to convey? Oh, I think I left off the other half of the sentence, like create oh, visibility okay. around <laughs> farms and the events that we have in town. and. I think that's another one with like the town website. If, if I can for a second. Go I, ahead, Valerie. Yep. I think that's- I can't see you all. I, I can only see three of you, four of you at a time at the moment in the current screen configuration. So just jump in. I'm, I, I, okay. I won't be able to see everybody's hand raised. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is where we were talking about really um, promoting farms and farmers in town and being supportive of our farms. And um, uh, we were talking about 
creating visibility. Um, and Penny, Penny said, you know, the farmers over there, people need to come out to the farm. So we were thinking, how can we be supportive of our farmers and um, create that supportive environment? Can you think of some words or things, Penny, that would be supportive of farmers that we could do? Well, you, you know, um, I, I see farming as a business. And if we're promoting our businesses in town, uh, the type of business that I do is agriculture. So I think it's about promoting all businesses in town. And, um, and, and so I don't think, um, how should I say it? You should promote the, um, the new dot co just like you do uh, Al Livesburg Farm. It's, it's all the same thing. So um, it's about just creating visibility and awareness, or maybe it's awareness, awareness of the diversity of businesses in Cape Elizabeth. And agriculture being one of them. One thing I want to make sure to say is that this map here could be something that's like a two or three or four year thing. And yes, it changes over time. But if something is mentioned here that isn't mentioned as a goal, it doesn't mean that it's not a priority. It is something that we will look to while making decisions. But maybe there isn't a current active action item for 2021. It might be something that's 2022. So I just want to make sure if anyone's like, why isn't there um, you know, a bullet point for every single one of these. I think for the most part there are, but, um, you know, there might not be something that's like a traffic project right now, but it is something that we keep in mind as we make decisions throughout the year. I can't think of a year where there hasn't been I mean, even tonight we're talking about addressing traffic and parking challenges. I mean, it I can't think the of best example. It was just in my face, <laughs> like that. But uh, no, that's fine. Um, but when when I think about infrastructure stuff, I guess is the point that there's 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 always something on an active year's work plan that addresses that. So I think that that's. I don't ever have a concern of there being a goal without a matching activity to go against it when it comes to things like infrastructure and things like that. Um, what, one thing I was sort of paused on for a second, because Councilor Devereaux brought it back up. So, you know, I was just using the example of the civil rights committee and, and, and possible recommendations. You know, we typically do this exercise and then, you know, like I said, Matt uses it as a working document somewhat and, and you know, works with staff, but it isn't something that we generally revisit and update um, by adding additional stuff to during the year, but but I think in that specific example, you know, it, it's something that's probably worth considering when there's you know active work ongoing from either a committee like that or any other committee for that matter that that may bring forward something that's new. Um, so that's just something to consider too. I, it's, this doesn't need to be, I guess, a frozen point in time where if it doesn't make the goal plan today. Um, I don't know. Maybe we think about is there is there a more prescriptive, you know, sort of planned and purposeful touch base, you know, halfway through the year or something like that, where you say, okay, number one, how have we done, and number two, are there things that need to be added, you know, based on new information and things like that. So, just well, a thought. Not, we don't have to solve that. Yeah, we don't have to solve for it right now, but it, it just occurred to me as we played that example out. So. Yeah, we could put that under um, the ongoing priority or ongoing initiatives, just revisit 
Yeah, may, okay. maybe one of them is to just, you know, more actively <laughs> revisit the goal plan, <laughs> um, you know, to, to ensure that we're uh, making progress and accomplishments and, and finding opportunities to add new things if, if they exist. So um, I am, you know, mindful of the hour and um, don't want to tax people too much um, tonight. So um, are, are there are there other comments people have? Things that I, I think this is a, a solid ninety five percent of the way there. If if we want to bring it forward in this draft form, and if anybody has any additional comments or tweaks they want to make, and we can we can offer that up as changes. I think we could probably move it forward at our meeting next week. Um, but uh, I'm also fine. If, if you know we don't have to rush it either, and if if we get to the meeting and decide there's still too much work to be done on it. it you know, the world's not going to stop spinning if it doesn't get approved till March either. So um, anyway, I think that's where I'd probably look to kind of wrap the conversation on it for the time being. The only thing I want to make sure we address is the, the social responsibility piece and wh where it fits. I, I've kind of seen it under the healthy and diverse community and um, I agree. We had yep. it under, you know, evaluate assistance needs among senior residents. Maybe, maybe something needs to go here. Um, we we had been using a, a phrase, a turn of phrase that was, you know, about you know generally providing for the social welfare of you know members of the community and things like that. I, I don't know if there's a, and I can give it some thought about trying to trying to get a little bit more specific th than that. Um, but and we do kind of have um, it here in the ongoing initiatives here where the offering trainings, participate in solving regional social economic issues. So it, it, it's kind of in the general business category too. Yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's, I, I'll, I'll try and, I'll try and put some very specific words to it, Nicole, what I'm thinking of, and I think Penny has brought this point up a number of times is, is really looking out for, you know, sort of the whole citizen, right? And, the, and that social and behavioral sort of aspect that exactly. goes beyond the you know um, um, the sort of nuts and bolts um, uh, delivery of services that towns tend to provide, but also um, looks out for the social well-being of all our citizens as well. So, um, Jamie, yes, um, I think we're like ninety-five percent there as well. But one of the things I, I truly hope that we could do at some point um, and maybe we don't need to do it um, I don't think we need to do it before our meeting um, but I would like to as a team as a group walk through each one of these and make sure that uh, we all have an understanding of what it means what it is yeah and I, you know what go might ahead. be a good opportunity to do that too. In some cases, not all of them, but in some cases, would be to have these, as, you know, as a component when we're going through the budget discussion in March, right? So you know, some of these are going to have fiscal implication to it, and and resources to be allotted to them by staff. And so, you know, as we're doing that. I'll pick one of your favorites because it's on the screen right now. The the strategy for fire and resource, uh, fire and rescue, um, but th you know those those are the kinds of things that, like I said, for at least half, maybe a little bit more of these. There's very specific sort of budget actions that correspond with some of these things too. So that's a good place to to that's sort of good. turn the work the words into plans and 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 things objects right. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah. Can I jump in really quick? Yes. I think that's a great idea. And also the civil rights committee will be, looks like they're gonna be presenting to town council in the uh, March meeting. So you'll have more um, input from them also. And that kind of blends right in with looking at this in March. I think that's great. Yeah, I think I mean what I'm what I'm kind of feeling in a way that we've never really done before, but I think would be useful is to whether it's as part of existing schedule 
and, and structure, like I said, with budget and maybe, like I said, maybe a mid-year check-in. And then, you know, as we're getting ready to sort of wrap up the council year, you know, in the early to mid fall, another touch point to, like, I feel, I feel like we should be more frequently coming back to these yes. and having yeah. active discussion around them as opposed to, oh God, great. We got rid of that assignment of creating the goals. Now let's go do something else. You know what I mean? I think that's so. great. Perfect. Okay. I agree. Well, like I said, uh, oh, go ahead. He's going nicely, just almost as a like not a cover page, but as a like an introduction to the budget. I mean, I could see these fitting nicely right at the front of that document, and framing a lot of our discussion around how the the rest of the budget plays out. Yep. That's the other thing to look at. I didn't mention the one town concept. This this phrase was on the website. I did not write it, so I know someone <laughs> mentioned. Um, needing to boil plate it down maybe a little more or something like that but um it was already on the website i think that that's, i think um you know a number of us have have um expressed that sentiment before and i'm glad that john brought it up again tonight um and i think it is something that needs work and um in the near term it's something that um you know i think jeremy and i can continue to bring back to the the um um joint subcommittee meetings that we have with with uh, school board uh chair and, and finance um committee chair and and try and get to a little bit less squishy place on that um for lack of a better description but um because i know that there's active things that have come up fairly recently that um with some decisions um that are in in discussion around personnel um that you know, uh, I'll just say, uh, sort of start to um, think about it, think about some components of that in a different way. So um, we don't need to get into much more on that tonight. But I, th I think the, the point was heard and the point is, is, is uh, an important one and, and um, one that we need to continue to focus on. So, um, so um, Unless anybody has any other burning um, thoughts that they want to get off their um, chest, I want to hopefully get Matt home safely tonight. Matt, I'm okay. thinking about it. I wish I wish you'd gone home first and dialed in from home. I hope I hope you don't feel you need to be in the office, particularly for a workshop like this. So um, I hope you'll I hope you'll take the liberty of making that decision for your safety versus. Uh, you know, feeling like you have to stand there at your desk so not a problem sir I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine and uh awesome work tonight i this is really a super productive night when you think about the heavy lift that the council had and yeah i'll be fine and i'll i actually have uh uh and uh, the council will have it in their inbox here shortly uh the one town concept that was written out back in 2013 that i think uh uh you know just meant one of those items that it does it does exist on on paper so uh, I'll ship that over to you as well, so that may be fruitful for discussions. And I uh, completely agree and appreciate the conversation with the council that uh, the goals are a lot. It's a, it's a living document. You know, it's one of those things that yeah, it's it's, it's not codified in in February and then uh, and then put uh, put aside and locked down. It's it's something that yeah, you know, uh, as as tw as 2020 has shown us, uh, priorities change sometimes midstream. So we uh, sort of have that and the ability to flex with that is. I think this is going to be a great uh, productive document and look forward to linking our, our uh, budgetary documents to this as well in the spring. So uh, looking good and, and thank you for that. And yeah, I've, I've got a four wheel drive cool. for a reason. So don't worry about me. <laughs> okay. Well, take, take it slow, be safe. Um, well, thank you. So, but no, in all seriousness, um, you know, definitely don't want you to feel like you have to, and we're all, we're all perfectly functioning from, elsewhere so no no reason you should be any different so okay thank you i appreciate that you got it to Deb, thanks for hanging home. you got it to coma <laughs> um deb thanks for hanging in there with us for the full night appreciate it as always so all right guys uh thank you very much thanks for uh any of the citizens that are still with us thanks maureen as well appreciate your um contributions and insights uh hope everybody is well and uh be safe tomorrow. Take it easy with the snow. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Good night.